Okay, we might get started. Is that microphone? Yeah, I think I'm loud enough, aren't I? Yep, good. Okay. I was just saying, it's been a while since we've been in a lecture theatre, so I'm forgetting what the technology is and how it works. Um, so, welcome. Um, my name is Joel Lane Thomas, and I'm the course coordinator of the dietetic programs here at Flinders. So, firstly, I'd like to welcome you to um, Nutrition and Dietetics here at Flinders. Um, the first sort of stepping stone in your um, in your career, I guess. So I guess while it's probably the first day at university for some of you, it's sort of starting to think, well, yes, I'm, I'm at university, but it's actually the first day of your career. So exciting times, probably daunting times for some of you as well. But um, you know, we're here to kind of help guide you over the next um, four years for those of you that are B and D first year B and Ds over the next four years, which will pass like that. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm the course coordinator. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jane Barber to you as well, who's sitting down at the front. Um, and Jane is the student experience coordinator here um, within our programs as well. Um, I'll let her sort of tell you a little bit about what she does um, and her role um, in a little while when she talks about the peer mentor program. So welcome. It's, we're in a lecture theatre which feels really formal. I have to stand behind here so I can operate the spaceship here at the front. Um, however, please stop, ask questions um, throughout. Um, make sure that when you leave here today, while you, feel, you might feel a little overwhelmed or a bit daunted, at least hopefully you'll feel that you know what you're signing up for um, and what the, you know, the coming few years will bring. All right, so please feel free to stop me. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, just in case you're not familiar with where the toilets are, for example, if you head out the back door and walk straight forward before you get to the high tables, um, so past the brown couches, high tables, you turn right and the toilets are just there on the, on the right. Um, if at any time there's a fire alarm and we need to evacuate, we're told to evacuate, the um, nearest evacuation point is just out to the green area, just out on level five here. Jane and I both have swipe cards so we can actually let you out, um, otherwise it makes it a bit difficult. So we might get some extra joining us um, in the next few minutes or so, depending on if they're stuck signing in at the visitor, visitor desk, but they can join in as they come in. Um, so we've got quite a busy day. Um, it's not like school where if you need the toilet you have to put your hand up, that kind of thing. I'm happy for you to get up and walk out you know, whenever you need to. Um, and then we've got some breaks dotted through and we'll see you know, how we go today. We'll try and keep to time. And so first of all, as is a tradition at Flinders, um, we'd like to recognise the traditional owners of the land, the Ghana people, on whose um, lands and waters that we meet today. So um, as I mentioned, today is your first day of your career and nutrition and dietetics um, you know, nutritionists and dietitians, we tend to use them interchangeably. Um, we're, it's a very dynamic career. You know, you can do lots of different things with your qualification. There are some traditional kind of roles, like working in a hospital, um, working in a community health service. But as time goes on, there are a lot more, there's a lot more variety in the roles that you, you know, you might find yourself working in down the track. And we've got a few speakers later today to sort of highlight the variety in the roles and, and, and jobs that you might be able to you know, get into at the end of your career. The other thing we find is that students are creating their own roles and creating their own businesses and their own things. So um, you know, there's a list of kind of a lot of traditional type roles that have been around for years, sort of working in private practice, um, food industry, those kind of things. But probably by the time you finish, there'll be a whole set of different roles that you might be, you know, that you might I'm getting to. Um, just some photographs to highlight some of those roles. And you know, many of these are students um, on placement. Um, so it highlights the kind of things that in the coming years you may be undertaking, where you might be out in rural communities working with um, indigenous um, 
um, peoples, um, learning, you know, teaching them about food and nutrition. It might be working with, you know, in childcare or in schools. It might be working in sort of one-to-one -one clinics. So lots of different opportunities will be coming your way over the next few years. In terms of where you'll find us, and I, those of you that are here at the end of the day, I can take you up to level seven and show you where we are. Um, so the College of Nursing and Health Science, which is what we all fall under, lives over at Sturt. So that's the Sturt campus. That's the main kind of hub for the college. But some of the discipline or teaching sections within that college are, are here over at Flinders. So um, we're here, speech pathology and audiology all live over at F Flinders Medical Centre. So we're basically right above on level seven. All right. um, in terms of physical presence over here in the hospital, we do have a kind of combined student college front with medicine and public health on level five outside the library, and I'll show you where that is as well a little bit later if you're still here. So some of you may well have been, in, you know, be part of the university before now, um, but I thought it's useful when you enter a, an institution or an establishment to have a, you know, a, a bit of an understanding of where we fit in the hierarchy and of the organisational chart, I suppose, of the university. So at the, at the top of the um, chart, we have the um, VC, or the president of the VC, um, Professor Colin Sterling, who you may well have seen on promotional material. Um, he does vlogs and things like that that um, you might have seen. Below the university level is the college. And so we have um, a vice president or an executive dean, which is um, Alison Kitson, who you may um, meet along the time here. We have um, the dean of education, so um, Associate Professor Chris Brebner, she's the Dean of Education, and she kind of oversees all of the um, programs and the education strategies and pedagogies that we use here in the college. So you may meet um, Chris Brebner at some point in time. Then we have what we call the um, TPDs, um, so they're the program directors, um, and we have Lucy Lewis. You don't have to remember all of these names, don't worry. Um, and so they oversee sort of individual programs, um, so we sit, un sit under Lucy. And then within Nutrition and Dietetics, there's sort of the three, um, three staff members who um, are the academic lead, which is Amanda Ray, who you'll meet later, and then myself and Olivia Farah are the course coordinators of the Nutrition and the Dietetics program. And then we have a whole team of staff as well that you'll meet um, a little bit later, and I'll show you their photos um, that are involved in the teaching and delivery of the, pro of the programs, plus they have other aspects to their roles. So um, when I was putting the slides together, particularly the staff, the Nutrition and Dietetics staff, it's getting more and more difficult to fit everyone on one slide, which is really lovely to see. So in terms of the course aims, um, obviously there's the sort of the formal course aims of the, of the, of the undergrad, the pro, um, bachelor program, is to educate professionals. So at the end of this, you know, you, and, and throughout your degree, we will be considering and treating you like professionals um, rather than students. Um, and what we hope at the end is that you'll be able to apply all of the science, all of the knowledge and skills that you will build across the years. So, our program is what we call scaffolded. So you kind of need to do the first year things before you can do the second year, and that all informs the subsequent years. So, um, you know, over the years you'll build those skills so that at the end you are able to fly the nest and work with individuals, groups, policy makers to be able to turn all of what you've learnt into um, education and um, strategies for um, the people outside of the university. We are accredited with Dietitians Australia, so that was renewed last year. So we've got a few years of accreditation before we have to do the cycle again. Um, and one of our key things here in the teaching section and also at the university as a whole is that we're promoting lifelong and self-directed learning. So at school, for example, or maybe in other programs, if you've um, studied other programs before, um, some there's a lot of structure, a lot of kind of... Um, the teachers telling you what to do, giving you the information, telling you when to do things. At university, it's quite different um, because you know when you leave here, there won't be anyone kind of guiding and telling you what to do in terms of your learning and your development. And that's what we're trying. That's what we then aim to build those skills over the next four years or so. 
So in terms of um, enrolment and the topics that um, you are hopefully enrolled in by now, um, if not, you've still got time to enrol. This is what year one looks like. So there's four topics per semester, keeping in mind that the program is only offered full time. So um, if you haven't fully enrolled, um, then you need to see me about that. Um, so you've got, in the first year, there's quite a lot of science. So there's a lot of biology, a lot of chemistry. And then in second semester, there's, um, we start to introduce some of the general nutrition topics. Okay? You do have an elective space in first year, so where you can choose something of interest from a list of options. Um, and depending on what you want to do, you can do that elective in either semester one or semester two. You swap it around with um, Health 1012. So that Health 1012 is available in either semester, so you can enrol in semester one or semester two version to free up an elective space for you. In year two, similar structure, and there's always going to be you know, 18 units, which is about four topics um, per semester. And in second year, you, you, know, you continue with that science. So keeping in mind that nutritionists and dietitians, we have a strong science background, hence why there's a lot of science in the, in the program. So you'll do biochemistry, you'll do human physiology topics, and more nutrition. So we build more nutrition into, into, the, to into the program. Um, we're looking at foods, we're looking at sort of the socio-cultural aspects of eating and of, and of food choice, um, and also looking at nutrition across the lifespan in terms of what are requirements and what are the changes. You do have an elective space in year two as well, and one of the popular, so this is the list of potential electives, um, one of the popular um, electives in year two is the nutrition for sports performance. Um, I know that many um, students come into the program wanting to work in sports um, and with athletes, and so there's, that's an opportunity for you to kind of get a taster of nutrition um, for sports performance. If you're looking through the list of electives and there's really nothing that grabs your attention, then you know, we are open to, I am open to considering other topics if you let me know what you've found and I'll just you know, let you know whether it's appropriate or not. Okay. Now, in first year, um, you probably won't find yourself here at Flinders Medical Centre very often because you have science, which is probably a good thing because it's hard to get into this building. Um, you'll find that you'll spend a, a fair bit of time up in the main campus, like in the science area um, and potentially over in Sturt because there's the health sciences topics are over in Sturt as well. Okay? So when you get your timetable, I'd recommend that you have a look at you know, whether... Uh, you know, you've got something over at Sturt and then in 10 minutes you have to be over at main campus, okay? Now that's doable if you go the back way over the bridge, but it's quite a brisk walk up a hill, okay? So keeping in mind, you know, you'll need to plan potentially how you get around the, cam the university campus. Um, if you haven't already, I would suggest booking into some campus tours. So there are some um, later today and there's more tomorrow if you haven't already been on them, but they're a useful way um, to find your way around. The other thing that I tend to say is on the weekend, it's really quiet here at the uni. There's lots of car parks. So I tend to say park in a car park on the weekend and go for a wander to find the buildings that are on your timetable. Okay? It removes the stress of having to, particularly in the first couple of weeks when you don't know your way around, um, move, removes the stress of having to run in and getting to classes late and things like that. So a little bit of time on the weekend might be useful if you haven't already done a tour. Um, we are coming to the end, sort of, you know, the later stages of the formal orientation week. However, there are other orientation activities that go on into next week, for example. Um, so I would hop on the web if you haven't already and have a look at what other things there are. Coming to university, you know, it is a big change. Um, you may well have left a lot of friends behind, you know, in terms of school. Um, and so getting involved in the university, which Jane will talk more about later, and meeting new friends and joining clubs, you know, this is when you kind of start forming some of those lifelong friendships that, you, that you'll carry forward. Um, Enrolling, if you haven't enrolled or you haven't fully enrolled, you're probably already aware that everything is via the web. You enrol via the web. You need to ensure that for all of your topics, you register in all classes. So topics will have you know, a mixture of lectures, pracs, shoots, 
you need to make sure that you register in each sort of class activity so that you um, appear in the different um, class lists and things. And then it will all be in your student timetable. Timetable clashes may occur um, depending on the electives that you choose and depending on sort of whether you are early or late in, enrol in enrolments. Um, sometimes classes are, you know, kind of full and you have to choose something else and it might clash. So if um, there are clashes, then you might consider changing the elective topic that you've done. I would contact topic coordinators to see what is recorded and what, you, you know, what isn't um, and see whether you can piece together your timetable that way. Core topics shouldn't clash. So if they do, then you need to let me know because I can um, chase that up, but they shouldn't clash. And that's what the current enrolment page looks like. Has everyone seen the enrolment page? I should see everyone nodding. <laughs> Good. Um, and so that's the bottom of the enrolment page. Any questions that you've got in terms of enrolment now and also down the track? Um, then, you know, if you scroll down the enrolment page, there are options that will give you sort of um, assistance to, to frequently ask questions. The other option is to go via the Ask Flinders um, website or um, e email, and that way that will go through to enrolment and course advisors who will be able to help you. If they can't, then it comes to me, and then I'll um, be in touch with you. Oh, and there's the Ask Flinders one. Uh, important to have some dates in your diary, so um, or on your f electronic diary. So the last day to enrol and the sort of the days that the, you accrue, you start to accrue fees is um, Friday of week two, so the 12th of March. Um, you need to enrol in topics by then. If you haven't, it's too late. Census date, which is the date where um, you are able to withdraw up to. Um, you know, you can basically pull out of a topic and it has no um, consequences, is um, the second Friday of week five. Um, so if you're in that elective and you decide, oh, I really don't like it, well, you do still have a period of time where you can um, take yourself out of that topic. Whereas the last day to withdraw without receiving a fail, so after census date, um, you've got until May the 14th to withdraw from topics without a fail appearing on your transcript. These are all on the web, so um, you can refer to them later. In terms of fees and scholarships, there are sort of um, some supports out there. There is a website that you can, you know, on the web that you can go to for finance information if you've got question about fees or um, fee assistance. Um, then I suggest you follow that up. You know, study is hard enough, um, and university life is busy and hard enough without having financial issues that you have to contend with as well. So I always say to students, I'm sure that there's many of you in here that have to work part-time or even close to full-time, um, which can make life busy. Um, so maybe you know, it's worthwhile sometimes just exploring options in terms of um, fees and scholarships and things. If you have any questions about, or you know, like you, any queries about the actual program that you've signed up for, then we do have our course page, which you've probably already seen. Um, and that gives you sort of the course aims, it gives you the program of study. And so it's kind of a, a checklist for you to make sure that you've enrolled in all of the necessary topics that you need to enrol in. So you might find that over the years, you'll be back and forth to this page to have a look um, at what, you know, what the program is study and um, the aims are over time. So I usually, you know, say bookmark that on your, on your laptop or on your um, Mac Pro, whatever you might got, you might have, um, and you can refer to it later. So how many of you have come from school? Most of you. I think some of you I could hear saying you had a gap year in between, but the majority of you are new to university study by the sounds of things. Um, and, you know, it is, I don't know how you, I would ask you how you feel, but you don't need to share, share those feelings about the kind of the jump or the leap from school to university. And often um, students come to university thinking that there, there won't be a big difference. You know, I did really, you've obviously all done really well at school um, and in your, um, your SACE results, etc. And so sometimes there's kind of a, um, an, a misconception, I guess, in terms of, you know, expect, different expectations of what university would be like. And so a few years back, there was a, um, a funded project that 
was carried out across the universities in South Australia, so UniSA and Adelaide Uni, that looked at that transition from school into university, so around first year students, um, and looked at you know, how can we best support or how can we make the experience of first year at university the best, we, best possible. Last year was different, everything went online, and so that was, if you talk to the current second years, then their experience is probably very different to what we would have thought um, this time last year. Um, but what we found was that, you know, there was a gap between student expectations of university and their actual experiences. Um, and some of the things that came out of that, which, we'll, which Jane will touch upon later, is, you know, how do we make the best, you know, the best possible experience? And that's where it comes back to those relationships. So the study is all there and organised for you in terms of you've got your timetable, you know where you need to be, the books that you need, um, you know, lectures and sessions, but it's those relationships and other things that you form. So the mentor, uh, mentors that um, Jane has established and she'll talk about later, I already heard you all introducing yourself to each other and I was thinking, oh, this is the start of some lifelong friendships. You know, I still catch up with the... Um, my fellow dietetic students when I went through, which is way more years than I care to consider. But, you know, there's a group of us that still we go out now. Um, and so, you know, you will probably find yourselves down the track still catching up, hopefully. Um, you know, ask lots of questions, engage with um, the student experience coordinator, which is Jane. And the other thing is, is, you know, we want you to enjoy the experience. We don't want the next four years to be a hard drag we want it to be an enjoyable one. So most of the st students surveyed had sort of unrealistic expectations of how much time university would require. So, you know, average time for a, a subject is six to ten hours per week outside of class time. So you've got your class time plus your out of, out of class time, which is probably double to what was expected at school and is generally equivalent to about a full-time job. So I'm not saying that, you know, when you're doing four topics, I'm not saying that to worry you or set you or overwhelm you, but it's realistic. Um, and so start thinking now of how you're going to fit all of that in around, you know, sporting commitments, work commitments, family commitments, okay? Um, they found that, you know, the key things that the students reported was that you need to be organised, you need to be self-motivated, and also that self-directed learning. So in school, you know, like um, students, you know, you t a, a handheld some of the way, whereas at university there's a lot less of that. There's a lot less of us kind of directing and delivering information at you. Um, they felt that they didn't feel adequately prepared. Now this could be different in this room, um, that you needed to learn a whole new range of skills to learn independently and study independently. And that, you know, close to three quarters found that standard of university work is different um, to school work, which, I mean, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? Um, you know, it is that kind of step up from school. You would expect that the um, expectations and standards would be different. Um, and so, oh yeah, so they, um, and over two thirds of students felt, you know, came to university thinking or believing that they would be given um, a lot of the materials that are needed, a lot of the information. And, you know, of course, we do give you lots of information, we give you materials, however, there's a whole range that, you know, we would expect, we would think that you would be responsible for seeking, finding and interpreting. So, in terms of making the best of your opportunities and, you know, kind of cementing yourself in your cohort, and if you look around, these are your, you know, your peers, um, the fellow nutritionists and dietitians um, of the future, then, you know, you've already made the first steps to um, coming into university and making the most of it. So you're already here at Orientation Day. Jane will talk about the um, peer mentors. You may well have gone on to flow already and had a look at your topics. You'll find that there's discussion boards. And so particularly in topics where, you know, like the big topics like chemistry, where there's hundreds of students, you can sometimes feel a little lost. So I kind of say, you know, organise events, you know, within your, within your cohort, so catch up for lunches, etc. but also, you know, it doesn't have to just be the dietetic students, there's a lot of other students out there to meet and get to know as well. Um, study groups and look out for notices um, from different seminars and opportunities that come up. 
Um, and later on, we'll be talking about different clubs and different um, how to engage with the university beyond just studies, and that includes the nutrition club, which um, some students will talk about a little bit later. So, I guess in terms of the overall, pro like the programs, it's my responsibility to, at the stage, to make sure that the programs run effectively, that they're running how we plan. Um, and so, really, what I, you know, ask for students, I'm, you know, I'm not in the classroom with you all the time, so. Um, please let me know, um, you know of any feedback that you might have. So whether it's positive, constructive, criticisms, you know, all that feedback is more than welcome. I kind of use an open door policy for feedback. Especially talk to me if you are having difficulties. Okay, if I don't hear from students, I assume that everything is going well. I always you know, we operate under the no news is good news um, policy. So if I don't hear from you, then I'm assuming everything is okay. Um, so come and talk to me, make a time to come and talk to me if you're struggling, if you're not enjoying study or if you need, you know, want to discuss um, study plan issues and changes to study plans, okay. I'd rather you come and talk to me than make changes and then not understand the sort of flow on effects. So last year, you know, during COVID, some students dropped out of different topics um, unbeknownst to me until I went through and checked where everyone was at and it, instead of, you know, adding only six months to their study, it actually adds a year to their study because they dropped one topic because of that scaffolding and flow on effect. So please, if you want to make changes, just check with me first in terms of what those consequences are or ramifications. And I'm up on level seven, so I can show you later where I am. And I'm always on email, um, which is just a bit different to everyone else's email. It's not my first name because apparently there's two of us. Who knew? So I'm going to hand over to, um, to Jane. Um, before she gets started, any quick questions on, on that so far? Or you already understand, you're already happy with all of that? I will be milling around, so you've got, if you've got questions as we go on, then feel free to. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flinders uh, Nutrition Dietetics course, and uh, congratulations on getting this far. Uh, those of you who came in a little bit later, um, if I could grab you at the end, it'd be great to get your photographs because um, we it's it's hard to remember everybody. So if we if we could um, do that, that would be great. So my role is the um, student engagement coordinator. So what that is is a, it's a new role that was developed last year, uh, and the idea is to assist students in engaging in the university. Um, and that's going to be quite tricky uh, as first years. You'll find that you'll be in classes with lots of other science students, med science, um, health science students, um, and you'll be with um, Bachelor of Human Nutrition students, so you won't necessarily all be in the same um, classes together. Um, some of the lectures will be online, so you won't be together with them. Um, and there's um, not many opportunities to have tutorials with um, uh, nutrition, stu nutrition and dietetic students together um, this in this first year. I'm teaching um, in second semester nutrition, physical activity and health. That is, um, it's now changed to online. It was going to be face-to-face -face lectures, but that's uh, online as well. Uh, so uh, you will get a chance to um, get to know me a bit there, but it will be online. So um, as well as uh, teaching. Uh, one of the things that uh, I do is uh, I coordinate a program called STU, which is Students Eat Well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on this afternoon when we've got some of our other students. But it is an opportunity for students to get involved with um, nutrition-related activities that um, you can deliver to other students on campus. Um, also part of my role is to be a support person. So it's a pastoral sort of care role. Um, and it's really for, um, for students where if you are feeling like you are overwhelmed or not coping with some of your courses, they might be courses that are, that are some of the topics that are outside of nutrition. Um, and you're looking for someone to, to go to. Jolene is, is, is one person you can go to, but also myself. Um, and, and that can be not only study related things, but anything that's related to difficulties that you're having with uh, mental health issues 
or your home life or challenges or, or finances. And I can talk you through some of those things and then refer you on to suitable services within the university, such as health and counselling. The other thing I do is um, oversee the uh, peer mentoring program. So this is an opportunity for you to meet with uh, students that are second or third years that have been through what you're going through now, um, and they've got the, and they can provide you with some great tips on how to uh, to navigate the systems and to um, and work and study tips. And some of the past feedback for students, they've found this really valuable. So it's really worth participating in this. All of you will be um, assigned to a mentor, um, but it's not uh, obligatory. You don't have to be part of that program, but um, so you can uh, participate as much or as little as you would like to. So you're here at university not just to study. So it's um, good to... to to be reminded that um, it's good to, to look after yourself, to your, your diet, your sleeping patterns, um, thinking about uh, balancing your life, uh, work, life and study. Uh, also, it's important to think about uh, having people that you can debrief with. There's going to be times when you're feeling uh, challenged or overwhelmed or stressed or you've got assignments due or there's a lot of work that's, that seems to be happening. So put things into place. I'd encourage you to uh, think about friends, family, uh, peers, or people within the university, uh, whether that's uh, myself or even making use of those student counselling services. There are some excellent um, services on campus. And also being aware of some of those um, stresses that are happening. Um, there's also other things that uh, are on campus, such as um, yoga and meditation courses that are run by um, Oasis up in the top campus um, and um, many other student um, supports. And then also remembering to have some time to enjoy sport or leisure activities and spending time with friends and being kind to yourselves. We find that um, nutrition and dietetic students are uh, very conscientious students. They're very keen to study um, and, and do the right thing and get some good grades. But sometimes um, nutrition and dietetic students can be quite hard on themselves. So remember to be kind to yourselves as well. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce you to our peer mentors. Um, I oversee two, two programs. One of them is for second and third years to be mentoring first years. And when you get to your um, third year, um, I also organise final year students who are currently on uh, clinical placement. So that's the um, fourth year nutrition and dietetic students. They help the third years with um, help with um, exams and specifically um, practising with um, their oral vivas and thinking about preparation for their placements in their final year. So I've actually... Um, so part, what does the program offer? Um, uh, study tips. Um, I think one of the things that um, other students that have been through this can help you with the expectations and preparation for the semester, um, as well as familiarising yourself with um, the campus and the facilities, um, the flow page. There's a lot of information to learn and take in in your, your first few weeks here. And also demystifying some of the uh, study things, um, how to submit um, assignments or how to borrow books from the li library, some of those practical things. And, and also engaging in uh, some of the social activities on, on uh, campus. And also help to build some confidence for you. So before I introduce you to that, uh, to, the, to the mentors, um, I just wanted to mention something about the Horizon program that uh, we have on, on campus. I was going to talk about it later, but we actually have uh, Rachel, who's one of our mentors. She's also participating in the Horizon program. So I'm going to ask her to just uh, tell you a little bit about that, just briefly. Thanks. Hi, guys. So I'm actually very new to the Horizon program myself. Um, what it is, it's all about career planning and progression. So if you're not sure what to put on your resume, they can help you with that. It's um, like, for example, I've done five short courses over the summer break 
on career planning, how to be organised, um, so many different things. You accrue points by doing different things. It's not just courses that are run through the uni as well. If you volunteer outside of uni, you can get points for that. It's all about um, developing that professional persona. So when you leave university as a fully qualified dietitian or nutritionist, you're in the best position to get a job. If you attain a silver, gold or platinum award, these can go on your resume and employers recognise these as that at your time at uni, you've gone beyond the books and you've done more. And some of the things that you can do, um, I know Jane just touched on, you know, doing things that are other than studying. So I volunteer at a local food co-op and I get to spend a few hours a week talking with people about what they eat from different um, sociological demographics, I think it is. Um, so yeah, it's really worthwhile looking into. It is available online to sort of get started. I recommend the best one to be getting started with Horizon because they will literally go through every single step of the way, different things you can do and you can tailor your own program over the course of four years or less to um, get the most out of it as to what suits you. Thanks. So that's, that's really designed so you have your qualification, your Bachelor of Nutrition and Dietetics, but also you have the Horizon Award as well, so that makes you attractive to uh, prospective employers. So we have um, three uh, mentor groups, um, and uh, it turns out that they're sort of roughly located in different geographical groups. So um, Rachel lives in the northern region of Adelaide, is that right? Um, we've got uh, Jasmine, who's sort of fairly central. Um, she's not here today. And we've got Chris, who lives in the southern suburbs. So um, we've only got... Um, Jasmine couldn't make it here today. But we've got a little bit of time now for you to come down the front and meet your um, mentors. Do you want to stand up, both of you, uh, Chris and, and Rachel? Um, so you can see here, these are the people I've, I've roughly put you into groups that uh, correspond to your um, geographical groups, particularly for, for Rachel's group. So see if your name is there. And this is Jasmine's group. She's not here, but I'm going to actually get you to um, spend some time with um, Chris today. So if you'd like, all like to stand up, and um, Chris is going to be over here. So we've got an opportunity, like 10 minutes or so, for you to just come and uh, meet your mentor. Uh, and see if you've got any questions. The other thing that we're hoping with this mentor program is because you don't have a lot of face-to-face -face contact with each other, you'll get to meet in your mentor groups in the geographical areas as nutrition and dietetic students. So um, that's an opportunity for you to engage in the university. So if you'd like to come over and spend some time with um, Chris or with Rachel, Depending on where your name was, um, if it was Rachel, if, if it's um, if your name, if it's uh, if you're under Jasmine's group, then go with Chris. And if your name is not there, then just um, allocate yourselves to either a uh, northern group or a southern group. Welcome um, to those of you that have just joined us, um, particularly those of you that are new to the university and all of you that are new to nutrition and dietetics. So welcome and thanks for joining today. Um, we've got a few things organised um, for you in terms of orientation, um, kind of some information that we want you want to be sure that you um, that you've heard. Um, I have received an email from the person who was doing the career planning session at midday that she's not well. So she has sent me a recorded kind of message from her instead. So I will play that, um, but I'll also put that on slow as well so you can refer back to it a little bit later. So she apologises, but we'll, um, at least she sent us something which is good. So I'm going to um, kind of give you some more information, particularly um, I'm going to skip over some of the information that I've already um, talked about this morning to the B&D 1 students. Um, 
so that you don't have to sit through it and listen again for those of you who already heard it. And then I'm just going to um, kick over to the MND1 and the Year 3 information. As I said this morning, I'm standing down here behind this because I need to operate the technology and we're in kind of a formal lecture theatre, but I would like it to be as informal as possible. Um, that um, you, know, you can stop me, ask questions, ask each other questions. Um, if you need to leave for any reason, um, feel free to do so. You, know, you can come back in at any time. Um, it's not like school where you have to put your hand up. And that kind of thing. All right. So um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jolene Thomas. I'm the um, course coordinator for the dietetics program. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background and then in a little while the rest of the staff that are here today will be coming down to um, introduce themselves as well. Um, but I studied here, my dietetics degree here at Flinders um, a fair few years ago now, um, and then moved into clinical um, dietetics. So I was always going to be doing clinical dietetics on the outset um, and um, went on to do one of the new grad positions and then worked in the clinical space for a number of years before um, sort of coming to Flinders University as a in a tutor, tutor capacity. So I worked at, um, in the clinical setting and here at Flinders at the same time for a number of years. And then um, after a few years, I moved to the university full time. Um, in that time, I've had two children um, and last year I completed my PhD um, in the area of um, malnutrition screening and vascular, patient, vascular patients. So I did that part time while working here. While working here, um, and I always say, if I can do a PhD, anyone anyone can. <laughs> so, so it is something for um, all of you to consider down the track at some point. Um, so, in terms of the topics that I teach, I teach into third year BND, first year masters. So I do the um, cover the clinical like the clinical type topics. So you'll see me in semester one and semester two. Um, and then it's kind of like they prepare you for your clinical placements and finals. So they're the topics that you'll come across in here. Um, so just for those of you that have joined us, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the lands on which we meet today of the Ghana people um, and pay respects to um, people past and present. So for the rest of the day today, the things that we're going to look at um, and that you'll hear about are um, obviously from me and other staff members in nutrition and dietetics. You're also going to hear from speakers um, from three um, of your professional associations, so Dietitians Australia, Sports Dietitians Australia and the Nutrition Society. Um, we've got a session on career planning. Um, we'll have some speakers that will come and talk to you about their career paths and they're three quite different um, dietitians um, that work in very different um, spheres, shall we say, so that'll be um, really eye-opening and interesting for you to see where your career could lead. Um, we'll look at how you can um, be involved in the university um, at more, you know, at a broader level, what other things you can be involved in to kind of round your um, university experience. And then at the end, we'll have um, a couple of final year students and um, a current PhD student in the discipline who will be talking to you about study tips for the BND, particularly for BND3 and MND1, but will probably be applicable for all of you if you wanted to all stay for that session at the end. Um, normally, you know, pre-COVID, we would have a lunch um, that we would set up here. However, we're not able to do that this year. Um, so for those of you that were interested, I will be walking up to the main campus in the lunch break. Um, for if you're not familiar with where that is, there's lots of eating places up there. Um, I'm happy to be the guide. I didn't bring my flag for you to follow, but I figure I'll be loud enough that you can follow me. Um, and we can head up there if you wanted to, but by all means, there's no obligation. And then we can meet back here in the afternoon. Okay. For those that don't want to walk up the hill, then I, we can show you where the cafeteria is on level four of Flinders Medical Centre. Okay, so let's get started. So um, BND ones, you have heard this a little bit already, but for the benefit of those who have just joined us, I wanted to talk briefly about the overall aims of the course in which you have joined. So first of all, congratulations on your place in the MND program, and also in those of you that were awarded a place for lateral transfer. Um, you know, they're, they're, all of our programs are competitive, and 
you know, achieving an offer is a fabulous achievement, so well done. And we're really happy to have you here, which is um, you know, great to see you all here this morning. So really the aims of all of the programs um, that we have is that we want to educate you know, and, and produce professionals, um, that you can take all of the science, all of the knowledge and skills that you will learn over the coming years of your program uh, in order to promote health and prevent illnesses in the, in the community, in individuals, and also you know, work with clients and, and patients that may have um, nutrition-related illnesses as well. So you know, at the end of your two years or four years or however many years we've got left ahead of you, um, that's what we, you know, we would like you to fly the nest with. I'd like you to have, just have a very brief think about what are your expectations about studying in your chosen program? Um, it's, I guess this is day one. Um, for some of you, it's day, you know, we're in two years into your program, into the program already, so we're year threes. Um, but thinking about what are your expectations? So what do you hope to get out of studying your program? And I mean beyond getting a job at the end, you know, that's what we all obviously would want at the end, but what is it that you want to get out of studying along that path? You know, what are your goals, both short term, and that might be, you know, in the coming weeks, over to the, you know, coming years. How do you prefer, prefer to learn? So particularly those of you that are joining, you know, into the first year of the BND, coming from school, thinking about, well, how do I learn? Do I learn by doing? Do I learn by watching? Do I need time to process? Um, thinking about how you learn is really important. You know, what difficulties do you foresee in, you know, coming in the next few years? And what help do you think you might need to overcome those, those challenges? Okay. Um, so keep those in the back of your mind and think about those over the coming days to weeks. You know, what is it that, are, you know, are my expectations and what am I wanting apart from a job at the end of it? It's really important when you're sort of, when we're sitting in the classroom and we kind of think, you know, some classes will have 60, roughly 60 of you in, in a classroom at one time. We're quite small, um, a small group but we sit within this big environment and there's so many influences on, on what we're doing here. So, you know, we've got the Nutrition and Dietetics courses here in the middle, but they're influenced by sort of um, our profession. So we've got um, Dietitians Australia. We have a lot of input from dietitians and practitioners out, out there in the, in, the, in the workplace. We've got CQAG, which is the Quality Course Advisory Group. Um, which also informs what we do in terms of our programs. We've got the university, so we've got all of those policies and procedures um, that you'll find on the web. We've got um, course management committees, changing education trends. And then we've also got um, the external environment. So, the, you know, the, the workforce changes. As I said this morning to the first years, you know, there's those traditional nutrition and dietetics roles out there for you, but there's, you know, it's forever changing. There are new roles and different roles, and some of you will develop your own roles um, moving forward. And so it's ever changing, and we need to keep up with that when we when we look at our program. We need to make sure that we're giving you, you know, the skills and the knowledge that you need to be able to work in that changing workforce. There's also new research that we need to keep keep abreast of, and health issues that um, come across as well. So. There's a lot that, in, you know, that has a, a bearing and an impact on the programs in which you study. In terms of where we sit in the hierarchy of the university, um, you know, at the top of the, kind of the hierarchy is um, Professor Colin Sterling, who you will have seen on various um, videos, promotional material, the news, etc. So um, you know, he's kind of, I guess, the overarching um, face and boss of the university. Um, our College of Nursing and Health Science sits below that. You know, sits below that. We have our own um, VP or Executive Dean, which is Professor Alison Kitson, who you may have heard of, um, and you may well see throughout your time here. In terms of um, education quality within our college um, and education strategies, then the Dean of Education oversees that. So that's Chris Brebner, and then sort of. At the nutrition and dietetic discipline level or teaching section level, 
you've got um, Amanda Ray, who's the academic lead, and then you've got um, myself and Olivia Farah, who are the two course coordinators. So I look after dietetics, and Olivia um, is responsible for the human nutrition program. And you'll get to meet all three of us um, along, along the track. I'm going to skip over the year one information because I've already talked about what enrolment looks like for year ones and if you've got any questions you can catch up with me a little bit later about that. Um, and year two we've already sort of spoken about that it's a lot more, um, there's still a lot, you know, heavy science underpinning but more nutrition and food kind of um, topics that come into play in second year. Those of you that um, are in year three um, and sort of similar with year one MND, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment more specifically, but year three of the BND and year one masters is where it becomes a lot more dietetic practice focused. So you've kind of learnt all the science, hopefully. Um, you've learnt sort of those general nutrition um, topics where you've learnt, you know, sort of social, um, social cultural aspects, you've learned about requirements across the lifespan, etc, etc. Now is when you learn where you move into more of those practice type topics and you'll see that they're all NUTD topics. So you'll um, start to um, talk and learn about research methods. So you're in fundamentals of, of nutritional epi, which is an online topic. So those of you in year three, this is what your enrolment should look like. Okay, you should all be enrolled full time. Um, and you'll have four topics in semester one and three in semester two because the clinical topic is um, equivalent to two topics. If you're having any difficulty enrolling those topics, you need to let me know. All right? So you've kind of got um, yeah, the, the research topic. We've got nutrients, role and function, which is a, a build on from biochemistry where we're looking at specific nu like nutritional type biochemistry. Then we're moving this first other two topics in semester one is where you start learning the skills of how to work as a dietitian or a nutritionist. In final year is where we build further on the research, um, where you'll undertake two research topics across the year, um, and this is where all of your placement topics sit. So in year three and year one MND, you do two short placements in semester one. Um, in year four is where you'll do at least 21 weeks of placement across the year. Right. So you'll do a clinical placement, a community public health placement, and also a four-week food service placement. So that year is it's very different to what you're used to, but it is you know, really exciting and rewarding because you're out there in the field doing what you hopefully will be doing after, after you complete your degree. The, for those of you in the BND, the other option is that you can, we do have an embedded honours program within our bachelor program, um, and that is a six-month um, honours program that you would do in final year in the second half of the year. Okay? So all of your placements will be in the first half of the year, and second year is a six-month research project. Okay? Um, entry into that is um, based upon your year three GPA. And so those of you that are in year one, something to keep in the back of your mind. Those of you that are in year three, um, that is something that should be front of mind as to whether that is something of interest to you. And we'll, you know, we'll have a session on that later um, in the year um, where, you can, where we talk more about that. The Masters has some strong similarities with the year three and year four of the BND, particularly final year. Um, so year two is very similar, the same placements um, topics, similar research topics, so you also have two research topics in final year. The slight variation, and those of you in the MND will have slightly different study plans depending on where you've come from with your undergrad degree. So you'll have core topics, which are the four topics that you can see there, two in each semester, and then your electives may well have been something that I've prescribed for you, or you have you know, um, the opportunity to choose free range from the um, from the option topics available. If you're having difficulty um, enrolling in anything or choosing electives, again, let me know. We give you a list of options um, to choose from, but if there's nothing there that grabs you or that doesn't fit, then come and see me and we can talk about other opportunities or other options. You also have an elective in year two as well, those of you in the Masters. We have a lot of key partners, um, particularly around placements in, you know, 
in year three and year four, or MND one and two. Um, we have them around South Australia, so the sort of the key health providers around Carlin, Salin and Nalin. You'll get to know those quite well, um, and the sort of the, the specific sites in each of those um, health services. And you'll find they're spread all around, you know, sort of northern, central, and southern Adelaide. We also have the Women's and Children's Hospital. We do have interstate placements. Um, the interstate partners and placement availability does vary year to year depending on what was happening. Um, for example, last year we had students placed in Darwin and Alice Springs, etc. And then, of course, COVID hit and we had to bring them all back. Um, but hopefully, moving forward, um, we'll still, you know, we'll be able to offer those placements again. So you can see we've got some in um, Northern Territory um, and some and a small amount of placements in Tasmania. We also have um, key partners in community public health space, um, particularly around South Australia, so Country Health SA. We've got a number of local councils that we partner with um, and some schools and other, um, other key stakeholders as well. We also have some interstate um, community public health partners that contribute to our program as well. Not only do they offer placements, but they also contribute to our, um, to our program development and changes to our um, programs through accreditation, so they're involved in the accreditation process. They're also involved through um, like our course management type committees as well, where they um, have influence and contribute to our programs. We do have rural placements. Now, sometimes um, students will come in and it's like, nope, don't want to go rural, don't want to go rural, and um, you know, sometimes students are allocated rural placements. And if you have no barriers to going rural in terms of you know, health conditions, financial issues, etc., then I would suggest that you grab a rural placement with both hands and cherish it. You, they're a lot more diverse um, in terms of the types of learning that you have because you work with patient uh, clients or patients across a very big variety of areas, um, cultures and backgrounds and different healthcare needs. So in year three, um, some of you know some of the short placements are rural, um, and then in final year, some of you know, there are rural placements as well. And then we have our offshore partners in Singapore. So for our Singapore students um, that join us, then um, they return to Singapore um, for their placements in final year, and we've got a number of um, partners placements in Singapore. In terms of our staff, and I said earlier um, that this slide is getting harder and harder to put everyone on one slide. Um, so this is um, our sort of core team of nutrition and dietetic staff. Um, some of them will come down a little bit later and introduce themselves um, very shortly, in fact. Um, and they'll give you a bit of background in terms of you know, what brought them here um, and where you'll find them in terms of what topics they teach. Um, some aren't able to come in, so Casey um, Dickinson at the top there, she's currently on maternity leave for this year, so she'll be back at the end of 2021. But I think everyone else is on deck, um, but some, you know, being part-time might not be available today. So um, when they come down, I'll put the slide back up and I'll fill in the gaps in terms of who's not here and I'll tell you a little bit about them. So in terms of Role. So all of us have teaching, um, teaching responsibilities within the program, but some of us have additional roles um, that um, we also do sort of in conjunction with the teaching. So um, Amanda Ray is academic lead, um, so she can tell you a little bit about what that means. Um, we've got the two course coordinators. We've got a placement education, placement education coordinator, which is Marion McAllister. And so she oversees and takes care of um, our placement program. Um, including the sort of development and brokering of new placements. And then we've got the student experience coordinator who you've all met is Jane Barber. Um, and so um, she has lots of responsibilities in terms of um, pastoral care um, and other um, roles that she'll um, talk a little bit about later um, for those of you that weren't here this morning. But Jane is another valuable resource and someone that you can sort of um, contact and talk to particularly about things that aren't necessarily related to study plans and study issues, okay? Um, but she'll talk a little bit more about that later. So a few of us have those additional roles. Um, in within the college, um, so the ones that I've mentioned, we're the sort of the key um, program staff, I suppose, for want of a better title. We've also got a number of um, other 
members that are nutri like we I call them nutrition staff or nutrition students, um, they're, but they're under the college like the wider college banner. So um, and a number of these sit over at Sturt. So the research team that you'll see on the on the side on the left hand side, headed by a Professor Rebecca Golly, um, they um, live over in Sturt. Um, and, so, and you may well come across some of those during research topics and you know, different um, events across the year. We have our clinical tutors, and so there are three um, dietitians that we employ in the different health services that are there to support and guide our students on clinical placement. And then we have a group of um, research high degree so PhD students who um, are working with um, nutrition staff as well. So some sit here up on level seven where we are, um, and a couple of them um, sit over with Rebecca Golly's team in Sturt. So again, the PhD students are sometimes involved in the programs by way of tutors, um, or they come and speak to um, the group about their research and things like that. So um, you'll probably meet them across the lifespan of your degree as well. Um, just to be aware that all of the staff um, you know, we are here for you um, and in terms of teaching and supporting you over the, over the years ahead. We do have other roles and I think it's important that, you know, for you to be aware of what else we do um, because just in terms of, you know, having an appreciation of what our jobs are and that, you know, we are, I guess, multifaceted, I suppose. So many of us, all of us have administration um, responsibilities, which could be college or university level or student um, responsibilities. Um, a number of us are what we call teaching and research staff. So we have um, research um, responsibilities um, and KPIs. Um, and then we also have community and professional engagement responsibilities. So we attend seminars, we give seminars, um, we're members of our relevant associations and we're also partners with community um, members as well. So that's kind of what we do when you can't see us, this is what we're doing. Okay. In terms of support and um, where you would go for questions and answers initially, um, is the SAS team, so Student Admin Services team. They are located over at Sturt. So you can go and visit and drop in um, to the reception over at Sturt or you can um, email them on the NHS inquiries line and then they'll direct your inquiry to whoever the relevant people are. Over there, um, you've got enrolment and course advisors and so they're the ones that are sort of the first port of call if you've got issues with enrolment or questions around enrolment, if you've got difficulty, they can also manage things like credit applications and course completions. And then you've got the um, student progress and assessment advisors and so they're involved in kind of supporting us and students related to assessment and making sure that all of your grades are finalised and your grades are correct, um, those kind of things. So that's probably where you will have more involvement with them over time. A little bit of housekeeping, I suppose, in terms of where you, we, we will be providing information. So if you haven't already found it, we've got the General Nutrition and Dietetics Flow page where we kind of, um, we will all pop um, information on there that's kind of applicable to everybody. You can also post information on there by way of the announcements and discussion boards. Um, the course booklets for your um, relevant course, so MND and BND, I've also popped on there. Um, so you can you know, download a copy of that and it has information around you know, the code of conduct, ethics, um, for Dietitians Australia, it's got information about how to reference academic um, information, also things like textbook lists and all of those kind of summary of all the different topics in your program. So a useful resource to have. Um, also um, information around health advisories, criminal histories and timetables and things like that. I would suggest you check all of your timetables to make sure you're enrolled in everything. Now, probably some of you would have had difficulty getting into the building this morning um, and so those of you that are year three B and D and year one M and D we will be organizing swipe cards for you um, in the next week or two right? and that's because you have quite a few classes here in in this building um, the year ones and year two B and D students tend to spend more time in other areas of the university so we um, you know you're able to come in via level four um, via security if that's problematic, again, let me know because we can um, we can readdress that later down the track. 
Oh, so I talked about the general flow page. That's what it looks like. We've got the sort of general welcome at the top, and then if you scroll down, there's a banner for BND and MND students. So that's where you will go for sort of a lot of general information, and that's where we'll be, myself and other staff members will be posting information over the year ahead and the years to come. So familiarise yourself with where, where that is, and you should find it already on your flow, your flow page. And just to give you a screenshot of that kind of bottom half of that page, this is where all the different banners, and you'll find all the key information that you need around key dates, um, placements when, that, when the time comes for placements, um, support that's available, and other things about sort of, you know, the um, specific professional organisations um, and clinics and things that you can dip into and, um, and register for. So over the years, we'll talk more about what those things are and what, you know, what's applicable to the different year levels. Um, but please all have a look at it um, and, you know, familiarise yourself with where things are, particularly around those supports. Um, so, you know, BND One's been fresh to the university, then, you know, have a look at what is available to you in terms of study and other support. I can just see staff creeped in, so I'll make it quick. Um, and so these are just some kind of blown up versions of those banners to show you the study support that's available. So the Student Learning Centre have a lot of resources. You can visit the Student Learning Centre and have appointments with them, but they've also got a lot of online resources that you can use as well around those general writing skills, um, academic skills that, you know, you, particularly those of you coming to the university into the first year, you may want to have a look at what they've got around, you know, referencing and academic writing. Remember how I said it this morning that sometimes there's a big leap between um, year 12 writing and the expectations at university. So I would suggest that all of you at least get onto the website and have a look at what, what resources there are and what recommendations they make. Um, and then so that you're aware, there is all of the sort of the health and wellbeing resources available as well. Um, as Jane mentioned this morning, you know, you, everyone has a lot on their plate. You know, you, you're not only studying, but you've got a lot of other commitments outside of the university that everyone's juggling. So we've all got lots of balls in the air. And sometimes, you know, we might need to have a think about how we're managing all of those different commitments and whether we're managing them well. Do we need to, you know, um, address some issues or, you know, put some strategies in place to help us manage all of those things. And so your first port of call could be on the on the flow page where there's a list of different resources. But as Jane mentioned, she's also available. Um, I'm available. You know, the course coordinators are available. And you've also got the health and counselling services here at Flinders, which are, is a fabulous resource and fabulous service for you um, if there's ever, you know, if there's a need. Um, and, you know, meeting with students, I always say, look at these things and think about those services before it becomes necessary because often we wait until something happens and then we can't get an appointment or we can't find what we need. So just be familiar for now. Um, and there's some more of those um, resources on, on the flow page. Uh, there is careers information. I won't talk about that because we've got the careers session a little bit later, but again, the careers and employability service provide a lot of resources um, they're always kind of emailing us with jobs that come up that we can send out to our, you know, recent graduates. And so they're a really good resource around um, skills about applying for jobs and things as well. So I'll let um, Ben speak about that later. Um, in terms of those of you in Year 3 B&D and Year 1 MND, um, placement requirements should be front of mind. Um, you all have um, two short placements in Semester 1 and you would have received um, information on emails um, sort of earlier this year or at the end of last year about um, attending to your pre-placement requirements, particularly around vaccinations and around um, post clearances and things that you'll need in order to go on placement. There is a website um, that goes through all of those things that you are required to meet in terms of compliance with placement um, requirements. Um, so if you haven't already, and I hope if you year 3 B and D or year 1 M and D you have already, um, you need to get onto those um, pre-placement requirements. Okay? If you're having any difficulty, then let me know um, or let Marion McAllister know, who's the placement coordinator, um, and we can 
to try and help you with that. If you haven't been vaccinated or um, you are opting not to be vaccinated, so particularly those in year one and year two, then can you please um, come, make the time to come and see me um, so we can discuss um, what that means, okay? Um, or discuss options for you. So that's just the, um, the detailed compliance information that you will need to be looking at if you're in year three, and in, year three BD and in year one. I'm going to skip over that. So all of these things are available on the flow site. So you'll need to download the certificates and checklists and have them signed off by the relevant professionals. And similarly with your um, pre-place um, criminal history screening. So these can take a while. Um, so you will need to get onto those ASAP. Uh, scholarships. Um, there is a website that talks about scholarships and you know, finances. I mentioned to the first years this morning, um, you know, we are busy um, and you're busy studying. And so you don't want financial issues to be um, a big problem for you if you can avoid it. Um, and so sometimes scholarships and finances can, um, you know, there's support around that available for you to inquire about. So again, something to think about. So before I get all the other staff to come down from the back that they're hiding at the back there, um, I just wanted to welcome you all to Nutrition and Dietetics. We're really happy to have you here, really excited to see what the coming four years or two years um, brings, um, as I'm sure you're um, excited about it too. You might be a little bit daunted, um, but you know we're here to support you um, and guide you over those coming years and work with you. Um, so on that note, I will get everyone else to traipse down to the front if they don't mind. So what I might do is, is there any questions on any of that while everyone comes down? I will make all of these slides available on Flow. here this morning. So as I mentioned, Casey's not, uh, not able to be here. Um, and Louisa, who's not here? So Louisa Matviasic, who's um, not able to be here this morning. So Louisa, you'll um, come across in year two of the BND program. So she teaches in year two and year three of the program in public health and community nutrition. She also looks after independent studies in final year. Um, so Louisa comes from a community public health background um, and has worked you know, for many years in that sphere um, before coming to the university. And she finished her PhD last year. Um, in the, and I'll let her talk a little bit more about that when, when you see her, but in the area of, sort of childcare policies um, around nutrition. Um, is there anyone else who's not here? Uh, Adeline Lau, um, I'll briefly mention Adeline. So, Adeline studied dietetics here with us as one of our Singapore students um, and recently started last year now, probably about a year ago, um, with us um, working sort of in clinical topics, but also um, in some of the year two topics as well. So particularly food systems, um, the food systems topic, no, year one, sorry. Um, so she can't be here today because she works part time, but you'll meet her, particularly in BND3 and ND ones, you'll see a lot of Adeline. And Dot, so Gerota, who goes by Dot. So Dot's a new staff member with us this year. Um, and so Dot has worked in, um, she works over with Rebecca Golly's research team as the, uh, as the other part of her time. Um, and so she's come from, ooh, Olivia, bring me in. <laughs> UniSA, that's right. So she um, completed her PhD at UniSA, um, sort of in that child nutrition research area. And she'll be um, t teaching into the fundamentals of nutritional epidemiology, so the online year three topic, and also in the final year research topic, she'll meet her as well. And so over to Olivia. Hi, everybody. 
Um, welcome. Some of you probably know me already, so um, you might have known me from the Bachelor of Human Nutrition. So I took on the course coordinator role last year um, and obviously teach some of the shared topics. Um, for those of you that don't know me, welcome. Um, I'm a dietitian and nutritionist. Um, I moved here from the UK, so I've worked overseas and here. Um, done a bit of everything, but ended up most recently in diabetes and aged care, which is what led me to my PhD, which is in that space, um, very similar to Morgan. Um, and topics that you'll find me in are food products in second year. Um, for the first year masters, you'll have me this semester for food studies and skills. And you will also see me in the food service topics in um, third year. I think that's it. I will pass you over. Thanks, Olivia. And, yeah, welcome from me as well. I'm looking forward to getting to know you over the next few years through the topics I teach. So my name's Carolyn Dent. Um, my background is in community and public health um, nutrition. And as well as teaching here at uni, I work at Wellbeing SA as a public health nutritionist. So bring some of those um, skills into some of the... the uh, topics that I'm teaching. So you'll see me, um, first years you'll see me in second semester in food systems and I also teach in second year topic um, ICEP which is in first semester and also um, which is individual, social and environmental perspectives of food consumption which is why we call it ICEP, um, long winded name. Um, but also food products um, this semester as well and uh, a third year topics I teach in the community communication and counselling topic in the group education module specifically and also um, public health and community nutrition which is also a third year topic so yeah I'll see you around the place and yeah welcome. Hello everyone welcome it's great to see you all uh, and I'm also looking forward to getting to know each of you a little bit better. I also have a community and public health background and worked for a long time in the community and public health space and then started teaching here about five years ago. So I now work here full time and a teaching specialist role. So you'll see me in the second year ICEP topic. Thank you, Carolyn, for uh, giving everybody the <laughs> definition of that. Uh, and that's this semester and also in community and public health in third year topic and the communication topic in the group education module this semester as well, which is a third year topic and master's topic. I was going to say something else, I can't remember. Oh, placement, thank you. And I'm also the placement coordinator, <laughs> so for the overall, for the um, nutrition and dietetics courses. So if you've got any concerns about placement things or need any support with that, please email me. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Alison Yaxley. I, um, my teaching is um, sort of at the, the pointy end of the degrees. So this year I'm coordinating and teaching into food service um, for BND3, MND1. I'm teach coordinating and teaching into the uh, research methods A, which is a final year topic. I'm coordinating honours this year and I am the food service placement coordinator for final years as well. So um, I will see a little bit of some of you this year, but next year quite a lot. Um, and my background, as that would allude to, is food service and research. And I am, um, unlike these ladies, a, a teaching research academic. So half my time is research and my area is around currently around um, ageing and malnutrition. Hello everyone, my name's Catherine Jackson. Um, I'm a dietitian, as we all are, and I happen to also be an accredited practicing sports dietitian. So I teach in the uh, sports nutrition topic, which, sorry MND students, that's not in your program of study, but for BNDs in second year, semester two, as an optional topic, which is an elective, you can choose sports nutrition. I do offer sports nutrition projects for your independent study when you get to that stage later in your degree. Um, like Alison, part of my time is teaching and the other part's research, and obviously my research interests are in sports nutrition. 
happy to talk to you more about sports nutrition at another time because you will see me again in about 45 minutes when I give you a bit more information about Sports Dietitians Australia. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Jane Barber. I've met most of you now. I'm um, uh, one of the lecturers here. Uh, my background was in clinical dietetics before I did my PhD. Um, the topics that I teach and my interests are around the science behind the nutrition. So those of you doing a lot of science in this first year, we will get to doing the science and the nutrition together in nutrients, role and function in third year. I'm also teaching a first year topic, nutrition, physical activity and health in um, the second semester. Um, and also I have a private practice and one of the things that I enjoy uh, talking about with my clients and uh, patients is around um, behaviour change. So that's one of uh, my interests. Welcome everyone. My name's Amanda Ray. Um, my background is in clinical nutrition. So um, for some of you, you'll see me working with Jolene and Adeline in the clinical topics, which is in third year of bachelor, first year of masters. I'm also the clinical placement coordinator, so that involves coordinating that final year, 10-week clinical um, placement. Um, I'm also teaching, I'm also the topic coordinator for communication and nutrition counselling. Um, and as Jolene mentioned, that in, will also involve a short placement. So again, um, preparing you very much um, for that um, final year placement. So um, there are a couple of modules in that. So Adeline and I teach the communication and counselling module. And then you've heard Marion and um, Carolyn talk about the other, um, the, the second part of the module, which is the communication module. So um, looking forward to hopefully seeing you all next week in the introductory lecture. Hi everyone, um, I'm the most junior member of the team because not so long ago I was sitting exactly where you are and I've had the privilege of being taught by all of these wonderful people. Um, we after, pay her to say that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> after I graduated um, with honours I went straight into a PhD in the aged care space um, and that presented me with lots of wonderful opportunities and one of those is that, um, as you know, Casey is on maternity leave and so I was able to um, put my PhD on hold for this year so that I could step in and um, support her topics which are um, nutritional epidemiology and then I'm also with Jane in nutrients role and function and you'll see me in a couple of other topics um, smattered across the semester as well. number of the core nutrition and dietetic staff um, who you will meet across the, the lifespan of your of your degree. Um, so thanks everyone for coming down. We are a very approachable bunch um, and we tend to, you know, we're always available here if you've got questions. So in terms of asking questions, firstly about topics, you would go to your topic coordinator and that will be, you know, you'll know who that is based on the topics you're involved in. And then after that, you know, you can um, come to to myself or Olivia as course coordinators if you've got questions beyond the topics. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, so any questions or comments? Any questions of these lovely people? No? No? If not, um, I'll let everyone head off back to their desks because they've got work to do. <laughs> and it's time for us to have a break. So. Um, if you want to, you know, jump up and down, we're due back here at 11.30, so you've got 25 minutes. Um, I can, sh if anyone's interested in coffee, I can show you where the level four cafeteria is. If you wanted to grab a coffee, then you can follow me and I'll show you where that is. And then you're able to sort of wander around out on the green area with your coffee if you wish. But thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we might get restarted if you want to grab your seat so we can try and keep to time today. So the next half an hour is um, a session with three speakers um, who are here to talk about um, their, uh, you know, one of the three relevant um, 
professional associations, I forgot the word then. Um, so Catherine's going to start off with SDA, um, and then Morgan and Chi are going to talk about Dietitians Australia, and Olivia will be joining us to talk about Nutrition Society. So uh, an opportunity to ask questions, start thinking about, you know, what what you want to be a member of, where you think that, you know, your interests lie and the directions that you're going to head in. Um, but I'll hand over to Catherine. So, Thanks, there we Julie. go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as I alluded to earlier in the introductions, um, I am a sports dietitian, have been for a long time. I won't tell you how long. A long time. And um, I teach sports nutrition and offer independent study projects in sports nutrition and potentially even honours projects um, and beyond. I have a PhD student at the moment who came through uh, the dietetics program. Um, briefly, just to encourage you, if you have an interest in sports nutrition, you can, as a student, join Sports Dietitians Australia. I've got some figures here in a minute. Um, and, and so you can be privy to the goings-on in sports nutrition and start your networking if that is perhaps um, a career interest for you. If you do have any other questions about sports nutrition as a career or as um, 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 to, to study as an elective, that's my email address. Um, Jane Barber, who you know, Jane um, is also a sports dietitian, so um, I'm going to be absent for a while in, in semester one. I've got some other things to do, so uh, if you have any questions, by all means, ask Jane. But I'll try and keep up with my emails while I'm away as well. So if you do have questions, I'll be back late May. Um, what is sports dietetics? You know, it's, it's, it's a battle sometimes because... Athletes think they know everything about nutrition. Coaches think they know everything about nutrition. Um, right down to the, um, the boot sprigger at football clubs think they know everything about nutrition. And unfortunately for those who aren't in the nutrition game, which you are, they think that sports nutrition is just what's the best supplement to take. And I think you'd probably already be aware that it's much, much beyond, if that was English, supplements. It's really food. Supplements can be useful. And we cover that in the sports nutrition topic as well. So our reason for being, and Sports Dietitians Australia accreditation, which I'll briefly talk about that course in a tick, um, is to try and combat, in a nice way, in a knowledgeable way, a lot of the sports nutrition myths that are everywhere. In, um, in sport and beyond sport. So as a sports dietitian, you'd work as part of an interprofessional team. Even if you have a private practice, you would work in a clinic perhaps, which would involve the sports physician, the sports doc, um, perhaps coaches if you're involved in sports clubs, physiotherapists, sports psychologists, S&C strength and conditioning coach. That's where a lot of the um, supplements myths come from but not pointing the finger or anything. What do Sports Dietitians Australia do? That's our professional organisation. We are um, associated with Dietitians Australia. Um, <clears throat> we have um, um, a professional development pathway. I'm part of the education committee with Sports Dietitians Australia. So, so we do, do have an education pathway for people like you who might be interested. Um, once you've finished your degree, there is, first of all, an online sports nutrition essentials course. Now, this used to be a required precursor to doing the accreditation course. It is now not required but encouraged. Although, if you do sports nutrition as a topic in second year for BNDs, um, then that would give you similar knowledge to the sports nutrition essentials course, which is all online. But the accreditation course, once you've graduated as a dietitian, it's a four-day course. Um, at the moment, it's held at the Victorian Institute of Sport because that's where the headquarters is, is for Sports Dietitians Australia. And it's full on for four days and you come out as an accredited sports dietitian. At the moment, it's being offered online twice a year um, and it may, post-COVID, if that ever happens, um, it may be offered as either online or face-to-face. -face. I'd encourage you to go face-to-face. It's a bit more exciting. There's a conference every two years in October, always held in Melbourne. 
um, which you can come along to starting this year if you want to, and I'll send out some more information about that closer to October. Um, as a student member, you will have access to various webinars and masterclasses that are offered online by various members of Sports Dietitians Australia. And there is a career pathway which probably isn't relevant at the moment. So, as a professional organisation, we collaborate across the athlete and fitness spectrum. Fitness Australia is one of our industry partners. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Oh, this is SDA slides. I don't know what water fact sheet means. We have various fact sheets on the Sports Dietitians Australia website. Go have a look. Sports Dietitian sportsdietitiansaustralia.com.au and um, there's all sorts of position statements for you to access that are written for athletes in the general public. So your career pathway to becoming a sports dietitian is MND or BND. Graduates would register obviously with Dietitians Australia <coughs> um, as uh, firstly as provisional and then after a year an accredited practicing dietitian. Um, for sports dietitian accreditations, I said you could do the sports nutrition essentials online course, but you probably don't need to um, if you've done sports nutrition, as I've said, and then you actually apply for the uh, four day Sports Dietitians Australia course. It's the accreditation course, um, which I can fill you in on more, perhaps closer to the end of your degree. So for a student member, it's $65 a year and you get access to all this information and you can attend the local Sports Dietitians Australia SA meetings, which are about once every six weeks and they're held at, the, at SASE, South Australian Sports Institute, on Valletta Road at Kidman Park. Um, for those of you who are a local Adelaide, it's the old Kidman Park High School where Department of Recreation and Sport is. So for you, the relevance is $65 a year. You get quite a bit of bang for your buck. And I've used up my lot of time. Time for questions or two minutes left? Two minutes left. Any questions? Seek me out if you want to have a one-to-one -one chat. Um, I might briefly add, uh, shouldn't end on a downer, careers as a sports dietitian are challenging in that there's very few full-time positions. Um, even with an in at the Institute of Sport in Canberra, um, it is um, part-time positions or sports dietitians contract themselves to the Sports Institute according to particular sport and our own local South Australian Sports Institute, again, you are contracting yourself to the Sports Institute. There really aren't any full-time institutionally paid positions to date, but that may change, in sports nutrition. So it is advisable that you also have a day job, which might be working clinical or community or private practice. Yeah. You've hit the nail on the head. It is always about budget and, yes, is a, a lack of budgeting, a, a lack, of, lack of available budget. Um, but if you want to work for AFL clubs, some, some of them actually pay a nominal amount, but some. Um, and you can, once you have your provider number as a dietitian, you can actually charge the individual athletes or players for consultations as well. So uh, there's ways around it. But happy to talk to you whenever during your journey about it if you're interested. Morgan's turn. Hi, you have to note Morgan's dress, which I always comment on. It's a dietitian's dress. It's got strawberries on it. My teaching days are Wednesday through to Friday and you can always spot me. I'm the person with the food on their dress. <laughs> so. Unlike the rest of us who had to cut food down our <laughs> 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 Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. And yeah, thanks, Morgan, for coming and talking about Dietitians Australia. Okay. Hello again, everybody. So, Dietitians Australia, this is your professional association. So... Um, who are we? Dietitians Australia is the leading voice in nutrition and dietetics. 
Um, more than a professional association, we're a strong and inspiring community. We're committed to supporting our members and advocating for our profession and building healthier communities. So advocacy is a very big part of what we do. Um, D Dietitians Australia and its members do research and deliver evidence-based information on food and nutrition locally, nationally and internationally. So who are we? We have over 7,500 members across Australia and overseas. We have a branch um, in each state, so that is the Engagement and Development Committee, and they hold local continuing professional developments um, throughout the year. I am on the South Australian EDC, and we are currently recruiting another student member as an MND1 or a BND3, so we uh, keep that in mind. And I'm actually going to hand the mic over to Chi right now because she was our BND3... No, MND1. MND1 rep for last year. Um, hi guys, my name is Chi and uh, I'm uh, currently a student representative for the EDC team. So it's kind of like a local SA um, dietitian teams. So we hold like activities and member engagement events to like gather everyone together. So um, the past, I have been in on board for like a year or so and it's definitely a very valuable experience. You get to connect with different dietitian from different fields, from aged care, community, public health, you get to know them. And also you're kind of like a middleman between your fellow students and um, the dietitian. So you get to channel the voice of uh, what your fellow student thinks back to them. And one of the best thing is they really listen to your opinion, they really value uh, us as a students because essentially we are the future generation, we are the em emerging dietitians, so you get to present a lot of ideas to them, what the student needs, so it's a really good um, upskilling opportunity for all of you guys. So definitely if you are interested to maybe s spice things up for the next year, definitely join me um, to become the student representative for the next coming year. And uh, we've also got another upcoming event, it's called Dietitian Walk, which will take part in Glenel is um, next month, um, 21st of March. So uh, you can look at that event in um, the DA website, no, DA, sorry, DA website, and um, there will be like uh, other dietitian um, from SA, and you can just come along, have a walk along the beach, grab a coffee, and just get to know us better, and yeah, just connect and have fun. So looking forward to see you guys to join me on the board. All right, so Dietitians Australia, what do we do? One of our core roles or functions is to provide the um, APD program, the Accredited Practicing Dietitian. Um, and the reason that, that is so important is that um, because dietitian is not a protected title, um, being an APD and being registered in the APD program lets the community and the public know that you have a university qualification. Um, the other thing that we do is we support our members with tools, resources and programs that you need to become um, a, a fully functioning dietitian. Um, we provide an ever-growing range of professional development opportunities and events and so that is either done here locally through the SAEDC or there are an increasing number of webinars available online through Dietitians Australia. And we advocate for dietitians and their roles across the food and nutrition space. So um, we're often doing uh, position statements and recommendations about how dietitians should be included um, across the sphere, that any sphere that includes food. Um, we work to build healthier communities through strategic collaborations and supporting the work of members. Um, previously, we've done what was um, Smart Eating Week, um, and then that's now changed and developed into Dietitians Week. So we have a whole week where we celebrate and advocate for our roles within the community. And we promote APDs through comprehensive marketing strategies on Facebook and things like that. So Ask a Dietitian was one of the slogans that we had last year um, for Smart Eating Week. So what is an APD? So APDs provide safe quality service and expertise in dietetics. As I said, the, the term dietitian is not yet protected, so this is how the public know that you are qualified um, to speak in this space. 
and it differentiates us from other professionals working in the nutrition space. Um, APD is a registered trademark and can only be used if you do um, go on to do the APD program. And only those who graduate from an Australian university that is recognised by Dietitians Australia um, can go on and join the APD program. Apologies, these slides were given to me by Dietitians Australia. <laughs> So our, um, the APD program is the only dietetics credentials recognised by the Australian government. Um, so that includes Medicare and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, you, get, um, you will need a provider number if you want your clients to be able to make claim backs through Medicare and through private health. And the only way that you can get that is by being an APD. So the APD program requirements is you must, uh, once you graduate, you undertake an initial year as a provisional <coughs> APD. During that time, you will have a mentor and you will need to meet with them every month and you will need to also do 30 hours of continuing professional development. And that requirement is ongoing. Um, so every year that you're a dietitian, you will be, be required to log 30 hours of continuing development. So your journey as an APD is you'll graduate and then you have six months from the date of your graduation to enrol as a, in the provisional APD program. You choose your own mentor. And then after 12 months of being mentored, you then transition to a full APD status. Now, as a provisional APD, you are still entitled to your provider number so you can start uh, practicing straight away. So again, this just shows you the pathway that you take. So um, you register for a mentor within six months, complete 12 one-hour uh, meetings with your mentor, maintain contact with them, and um, at the end of the 12 months, you become a fully-fledged APD. Um, so one of the things that um, the DA does is they provide lots of uh, continuing professional development and they... Um, ask you to go through and as part of logging that you've got to go through and reflect and assess on your learning that you've done. Um, so this is just a reflection that when you graduate that's not when your learning is completed, that's actually when your learning just begins. Um, so you've got a lifelong of learning and um, Dietitians Australia is there to support you through that. So dietetics is a very broad profession um, and there are lots of different spaces in which you can be a dietitian, you can um, impact policy, you can be clinical, community, sports, public health, you can be an educator, um, food service dietitian, researcher um, in food service management. There are lots of different roles and Dietitians Australia has uh, special interest groups on their website that will support you in whatever role that you choose. So as students, is anybody here currently a member of DA? Yeah, excellent. I'd like to see everybody putting their hand up after the end of today because membership is free. If you're a student, it's absolutely free and you get a lot of perks with that membership. So you get, because of the university, you get free access to um, PEN, which is practice-based evidence in nutrition and that's a fabulous resource for looking up um, a lot of information about different disease states and what the, what the evidence as a whole says um, we should be doing. Um, you get other advantages um, and perks for being members. You get free access to ProQuest. So as a student, you are um, through the library, you get access to all of the search databases. Once you graduate and you don't have access to uni anymore, your Dietitians Australia membership gives you access to ProQuest along the way and the um, journal that they publish. Um, you get discounts on um, attending the conference. So there's a conference every year. This year it's in Brisbane, Melbourne. This year it's in Melbourne. Um, and you get discounts on, so they have a centre for advanced learning where they have um, professional development courses that you can do uh, and you get discount on those as well. 
You get 12 free webinars, you get access to the resource library, um, career support, you get um, there's special spaces in there for emerging dietitians and student dietitians. You get access to classified ads. Um, the, a portal for connecting with other dietitians is called SharePlate um, and your membership allows you to connect and communicate with dietitians across Australia. Um, as I said, there are various special interest groups and education groups on there. There's committees that you can sign up to and become involved in. And um, one of the things that as dietitians we should all be involved in is thinking about when there's a call for a public submission. So, for example, recently there was the um, inquiry into aged care. How are we as dietitians contributing to that information? Because that's a role that each of us should be thinking about taking. How can we influence nutrition across all of Australia? Um, Dietitians Australia has different awards to recognise your work and contribution and as I said I've already mentioned share plate there. And so again share plate's a little bit just like a um, online, it's a bit like flow actually for dietitians, um, the way that you put your posts in and you connect with each other. Um, you'll get sent out a weekly update from the the flow, the flow sites that you sign up for. And so to get started, um, if you go to the website um, listed on there, dietitiansaustralia.org.au, as I said, student membership is free. Um, so absolutely encourage each and every one of you to sign up for that. And that was all that I had. So did anybody have any questions about Dietitians Australia? or the South Australian Education Development Committee. Huh? And so Morgan will, will organise some kind of voting system for the other student reps yes. in the next couple of weeks. So when you've all had a chance to kind of get to know each other a little bit more, then we'll organise yeah, kind of an election um, for, for those of you that are interested in being the other student reps. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Um, my presentation is not that polished. There is no animations and uh, very brief. So you've heard of some associations that are going to be really important to your career as dietitians. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the course coordinator for the Bachelor of Human Nutrition and um, I am also the co-convener for the N Nutrition Society of Australia Adelaide branch. So. This association, by its title, might insinuate that it is for non-dietitians and more sort of general nutrition um, scientists. That's actually not the case. We have lots of dietitians also a member of the society, but I guess as um, emerging dietitians in this room, this might be a little bit down your list in terms of priorities in, in membership um, because the, it is a fee-paying membership. But what I would say to you is to look out for events that we run because they are extremely inclusive and, as I said, do um, attract a broad range of nutri nutrition professionals outside of dietetics who you may like to rub shoulders with. Um, it, is, it is a good and fun group. Um, so Nutrition uh, um, Society of Australia is uh, an association that represents nutrition scientists. Um, so it could be... Uh, nutrition researchers working at SAMRI or CSIRO, could be dietitians, could be nutritionists, could be food scientists, um, people working in industry developing foods. Um, so it is quite diverse in terms of who is eligible to be a member and who comes along to our events. Um, it operates much the same as many of the associations that you've heard about today and others that you'll come across. Um, so we have a national body, a national office, and each state and territory has a voluntary um, uh, division, if you like. Um, that committee is nominated in each year. There are always student representatives, so we do have some Flinders um, representation on our committee this year and have done every year. Um, the committee does tend to predominantly be academics from the three universities in Adelaide, with some, also some researchers usually, um, and then we have our student reps. 
So if it is a committee that you're interested in being involved in, I would encourage you to look out for the call towards the end of the year for student reps. We're a really relaxed bunch, as you can see from my slides, they're not very polished. Um, we are very casual in terms of how much we catch up, but we're also very passionate about nutrition and nutrition science. I'm not gonna read everything that's on those slides. The benefits of being a student member should you decide to join, if you um, decide you want to, to go for the treble and, and get membership to all of the ones you've heard about today, is that um, you will be eligible once you're qualified with your degree to apply to be on the register of nutritionists or you are at least in contact with those people that are registered nutritionists in South Australia and um, more across Australia. You'll receive the newsletter and uh, links to webinars, so some of the sessions that we put on are only open to members um, without a fee and those recordings go up onto the website. As a member you get access to those all of the time and there are various awards and scholarships that students are eligible for so that could be conference travel, it could be um, an award for a poster or a publication and it is another networking opportunity so you've probably heard a lot about networking already. Um, these professional associations and the events that they run are fantastic ways to just coincidentally rub shoulders with people that might have similar interests to you and down the line might be good points of contact for work. So if you want to know a little bit more about NSA, you are more than welcome to head to the website, have a look. There is a join NSA section, it's an online form. And the fees are calculated pro rata across the year. So a full year's membership is $85 for a student. Remembering that all these association fees are tax deductible generally. Um, at the moment, because we're midway through our financial year, I think it's sitting at about $45 for, for membership if you want to. Um, as I'm obviously very involved in the university um, and also on the committee, what I do tend to do is send out flow announcements for any upcoming events we might do. And even if you're not a member, the nominal, the fee for students to attend is usually fairly nominal. So um, look out for those. We tend to do an annual dinner in July, which usually has a range of speakers with a matched dinner at a pub somewhere in Adelaide. They're normally a really great night. So we're hoping to do a face-to-face -face event this year. Obviously last year we couldn't. Um, we do tend to do online or in-person seminars with visiting speakers, so probably leaning more towards online this year. Um, we have an AGM, which is a nice little mingle networking event um, with a small business component at the end of the year. And um, something we did last year that we'll probably run again this year that might be of interest to you is a careers um, panel and um, student sort of um, centred event. So... We always run something just for students at the end of each year, usually around careers and sort of speed dating with potential employers, which is open to nutritionists and dietitians. We're, we're not choosy. Um, but last year, because of COVID, we actually ended up joining forces with all of the states and territories and did an online version. And we had several hundred students attend. Um, and the panel was obviously made up of speakers from all over Australia, which gave a lot more um, breadth and experience. So. Because it was such a success, we're probably going to look at doing that again this year. So that'll, that'll likely be around the August time. So I'll put a call out for that if that interests you. Um, just because you're training to be a dietitian doesn't mean you're necessarily going to work as a straight dietitian. You might branch out into a few other things as well. So it's another good opportunity to hear what else is out there with your credential. So I think that was it for me. Oh yeah, those are the events. Was, oh, and the other thing that we all hear a call out for is Science Alive. So each year in August, uh, the Nutrition Society have a stand at Science Alive, which is a three-day um, event looking at promoting the sciences as careers. Um, and we look for uh, student help for manning that stand. So we'll put a call out for students there. You'll be rubbing shoulders again with Adelaide Uni and UniSA students as well as some of the committee from NSA in Adelaide. So watch this space. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Any questions for anything? I think probably what comes out from when, and the next session we'll kind of build upon it, is that in thinking it, it's time to start thinking about ways in which you can um, develop your sort of, I guess, your tool set and your skill set and your knowledge set beyond just what you're studying here at the university. You know, keeping in mind that every year there's about you know 50 50 graduates from the program that will have all studied the same as you, and it's thinking of ways that what will make you stand out from the crowd, um, when it comes to applying for jobs and you know getting work at the end of the year, 
and joining some of these associations and getting involved and attending different events and different things that come up are things that you can always put on your CV or your resume, whatever you want to call it, at the end, you know, at, at the end of the year when it goes to them, they're looking for jobs. Um, so, you know, in future employers look for those additional things that people do um, beyond just the qualification that you have on, on your transcript at the end of your degree. So, you know, have a look through the three websites, you know, think about where, you know, what's going to interest you, and then judge is Australia's free, so why wouldn't you join? Um, and start thinking about, you know, how can you get involved in your um, nutrition and the Star Tech community and make yourself stand out from the crowd. Do you agree? Yeah. Adelaide's a small place, so names get known. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a good opportunity to just get your name known early <laughs> and to have those leadership sort of activities put on your CV to help you stand out, for sure. And it's fun. Yeah, it's A fun. lot of the activities are great fun. Too. Even if it's at pubs, sound like fun to yeah. me. <laughs> There's no downside to that. <laughs> That's right. Thanks very much, Olivia. No worries, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, Meg Alexander, who's from the Careers and Employability Service, um, let me know last night that she was that she's not well, and so she can't come in and talk to you today. But she did um, send a recording that she that she had of kind of the main gist of what she wanted to talk about today. So I'm going to put that on for you to watch. Um, if you want to get up and move around, feel free to do that. Um, and then afterwards, we would we've got three um, dietitians nutritionists coming in um, that will talk about their career and how they kind of got to where they are now. So I might actually see if I can work out how to dip the lights, but don't fall asleep. to speak amongst yourselves. Hi, and welcome to session one, Career Management for Health Professionals. My name's Meg and I'm a Career Development Consultant with the Flinders University Careers and Employability Service. So this is our first module in a series that we've developed for health professionals. This module will be considered as assumed knowledge for all of the other subsequent modules. So really needs to be viewed first in this whole sequence because we're going to work from career management for health professionals, really knowing yourself and essential career management skills. And then we go on to look at writing your resume for the health professions, cover letters, one page, we got a module that's more about the two-page cover letter approach that we see typically with SA Health. Also, we're going to talk about addressing selection criteria in that module. And then we have a module on interview skills for health professions. Now, we're going to be using a lot of different examples from the different allied health professions and paramedics across all of these different modules. The principles are the same, no matter what profession you are coming from. So I'll just stop the video for now and let's get underway. Where do you find the Careers and Employability Service? Well, you'll find us on your Okta dashboard. So just look for the Career Hub icon and start to explore what's available to you from the careers service. What we're going to focus on in this initial module, career management, is really giving you some ideas around how you can plan your career, identifying your goals, what steps and options you might consider 
to assist you in working towards achieving those goals. So we're going to talk about the whole career planning cycle. We're going to look at a whole range of different career development strategies and your goal setting from there. Now, to accompany all of our sessions, we have specialised resources for you. So these include sample resumes, um, resume templates, sample cover letters, um, interview questions, specifically for your field. So for many of you, that'll be nursing and health sciences, navigate by your college. Um, for some, that will be via medicine and public health. So we're really working across um, the paramedics, speech pathology, audiology, nutrition, dietetics, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, disability, and all of those different um, groups. So there's a specific page for you with career toolkit and plenty more downloadable resources. Now, the career development cycle, this is what we're going to really step through today, learning about yourself as that essential cornerstone for all of the other things you need to do to manage your career how you go about exploring your options. So what options are you considering and where are they? Clearly, you want to be open to a whole range of different starting points as you transition into your allied health career. But equally, exploring, you know, your hierarchy of preferences and where you might look to commence your career. Looking at what those options are, what sorts of skill sets will you need to focus on to be a real standout candidate for those roles? Which then leads us to how do you market yourself? So we'll have a few tips for you around that. The performing stage um, is showcasing all of those skills, qualities and talents in your chosen role. So let's get started with learning about yourself. The why you. What is your career story? Because one thing that we're going to emphasise throughout the modules is really having that strong concept of your professional identity, your unique story. Everybody has a unique story and a skillful job application and presentation and interview is going to really highlight those unique aspects about you but also had that linking factor as to how does that relate to the job. So we've got plenty of prompt questions for you to review in your slide notes, but let's get started by looking at what you bring to your professional area. Let's look at the academic side to start with. So thinking about why did I choose my course of study? Quite often an interview, you might be asked, or even on placement, um, what led you to choose this particular area? So really reflect on what were the factors that led you to make that particular choice? What have you really enjoyed about your studies? What strengths do you think you've, you particularly demonstrated? What topics, subjects, projects, experiences really stand out to you as key learning experiences? So really analyse everything that relates around that learning area. You might extend that beyond your uh, core studies to professional development that you've undertaken, other forms of learning related to your particular career sector. Then think about well, what experiences do I have that relate to my profession? Now, for most of you, that will be placement, placement experiences, and then really thinking about, well, what settings was I in? What did I learn about those particular roles? So it's also um, exploring the practical side of your learning. But go a little bit further than that. What learning might you bring from outside of your course? So some of you might be working in the sector in a role such as allied health assistant or disability support worker or other sorts of roles. Some of you might be doing some volunteering that relates to that particular career field. So really explore all of those aspects. Another component to that exploration and really thinking about what were standout learning examples, what sort of feedback did you get from the people around you on placement? 
So what feedback have you received in your reports? Uh, what consistent feedback have you received perhaps in conversation with your supervisors or from patients, families and colleagues? So really take note because that's all part of your unique experience in those settings. Then have a look at what you bring from your employment background. Now, for some of you, that might be casual employment. Um, for some of you, you might be transitioning from other career areas. So that has a part in your story. If you've worked for five years in hospitality roles, then see that as representing to the reader that you have five years experience in dealing with the public. You have a confidence, professionalism, maturity, resilience. You can work in a team, work under pressure. You can organise yourself. That has a part in your story as well. If you're transitioning from other careers, consider really, you know, what prompted you to embark on a career transition. That's a major thing to do. Then start to explore who you are when you aren't working or studying. The extracurricular things that you might do. Nobody makes you do those things, but that also has a part in your story as well. And we'll explore that um, when we start to look at the resume and some of those other aspects to marketing yourself. So it's really looking at everything you bring to the profession from all areas of your life. If we look at the right side of the slide, we see the arrow going up, increasing personalization and differentiation. So the more you have in each of those different components, the more sort of unique points of difference we're starting to identify that we can show the employer. And if we have a look at that quote, and I've got the, the link for you in the slide notes, it's about also linking achievement, not just from your course, but from the other aspects of your life and to see how are you applying that learning and knowledge to your career. So if you think about your placement experiences, how might you have drawn on some of those other areas of your life when you go to placement? Let's explore this a little further. Why you, your skills and strengths? So again, there will be a number of people who have the same academic background as you. And this speaks again to knowing your unique story and knowing what differentiates you. So look to the sort of feedback and an understanding of how other people see you. Sometimes it's hard to look at ourselves and go, oh, I've got all of these great qualities. What do other people say about you? What do they see in you? What do they value in you? So see if you can get five people to describe that to you. This starts to become the characteristics that you might highlight as part of your personal brand. And just that tip there again, review your placement reports. What are the strengths that are highlighted? What feedback comments do you get from all the people you interact with on placement? You can draw on this and you can mention this in your applications. And it's actually sometimes really nice where you actually have that extra layer of evidence from other people around you that you can cite to back up the claims you're going to make about yourself. So that's just a few comments and thoughts on knowing yourself, learning about yourself, knowing your story. This is going to really help you when it comes to writing of the resume, writing applications and also going to interview. Can you tell me a bit about yourself and why you chose to study your course? Let's now have a look at where do you want to apply your skills, your knowledge, your qualities and your experiences? So what options are you really drawn to? What are employers in those areas really looking for? And what's going to make me stand out? Okay. So we're starting to look at ourselves and relate that to our profession. So this is starting to really formulate some ideas around a job search strategy. So again, keeping in mind, you want to be fairly open about those initial steps, but it's a good idea just to know what your highest preferences are. So when you think about the settings you would like to work in, what sorts of cohorts, populations, age ranges, presenting issues, the needs of the, the patients, clients you might be working with, what setting 
are you drawn to? What does that look like? Do you see yourself in a public setting, community setting, small private practice, large not-for-profit? So really start to think about the sorts of organisations you might work in. Now, what are some organisations that match that criteria? Start to research who they are. Look on their jobs pages. Go on jobs boards and search for occupations, search for job advertisements. Start following them. So they'll all have newsletters. They'll all have a social media presence. So you can start learning and deepening your knowledge about what makes those organisations special. Also thinking about the geographic location that you might want to work in. Are you looking at a city-based context? Are you drawn to working as a health professional in rural settings or remote settings? Are you open to looking at options interstate? At some point, are you looking at overseas employment? And then it's about really starting to identify what those organisations want. If you're aiming for a particular speciality, might you need to do some further training, some additional courses? Being aware that there's a whole variety of starting points for your career. It could be full-time, it could be casual pool, uh, it could be short-term contract, it could be part-time. So there's lots of different ways you might start your career. And of course, starting to develop your networks across these organisations. Every placement you do provides an opportunity to connect to people from all sorts of different disciplines and backgrounds. Every time you go to a professional development event, there's that wonderful opportunity to meet and make connections. And to do so in a strategic way when you have reflected on your goals. Here's a few tips on researching target organisations. This is part of your career management strategies. Uh, this is also a component, again, that is so vital across all of our modules. So for every application you write, you need to have researched that organisation and there needs to be a meaningful comment in that application about why you wish to work for them. We hear again and again from employers, they are looking for someone to show them that they have thought about who the organisation is and how they might match that organisation's mission, purpose, values, what that, that organisation is there to do. So, that's about your research. What does this organisation exist for? What is their purpose? What goals do they have? They all have value statements. Now you need to think about, well, what do those values actually mean to me? And that's a fairly deep level of reflection. How might you embody and demonstrate actively that you uphold those values? What makes that organisation unique? You want to be seen as unique in your application, so do they. So following their news, what's happening for that organisation, obviously health organisations have been, um, you know, very highly profiled in the media of late. Follow these organisations, really identify what's happening, what's important to, do to them, what trends are impacting them. As an example there, um, we've included the state public health plan. If you're interested in working for SA Health, there's a public health plan. So you want to start to get familiar with these sorts of documents. Let's have a look at that a little bit further. And this is again about the importance of doing your research. This is also about making tailored applications. So we've included three examples there broadly relevant across the allied health disciplines from Rest Haven, SA Health and Anglicare. Now you'll notice that each organisation, there's some similarities, but there's different language. So SA Health, values of integrity, respect, accountability, care, excellence, innovation, creativity, leadership, equity. So consider who that organisation is there to support and serve. Anglicare, five key values. Integrity, compassion, stewardship, equity, servant leadership. Rest Haven, trust, dignity and choice. 
So you re need to really be open to reflecting on what that means to you and how you might show that. That's just a few examples. Then, as you start to monitor job advertisements, and I would really encourage you to do that as part of your career management, whether you're actively searching for work or that might be a little bit further down the track for you, get used to searching for those opportunities, trying out different keywords, and also just having a look at different application styles and formats. And again, what particular skills will make a candidate stand out? And how can you develop those? So we would certainly encourage you to consider joining the Horizon Professional Development Award here at Flinders University, self-paced. It's a points-based system. Um, so the more activities you do eligible for points, the more points you accumulate from bronze to platinum levels. And there's a lot of flexibility around what those activities might be from volunteering, coming along to our workshops. And of course, uh, we have online workshops too. Um, leadership opportunities. You could be doing massive open online courses, MOOCs. So there's a whole range of ways. As a health professional, Often you'll see in the selection criteria, they're looking for people who are committed to professional development, committed to lifelong learning. So participation in these sorts of opportunities is a great way to demonstrate that. You can also demonstrate that really practically through your placements. So in a way you can see placements at that wonderful, valuable learning opportunity but it also can be seen in some ways like an extended job interview where you're showing your attitude and your qualities as that learner emerging health professional to people who could actually end up being your peers and colleagues in the future. So it's around showing, researching that organisation when you're going on placement, showing that absolute interest in that organisation and everybody within it. Showing the confidence, not being overconfident. Um, obviously, you need to work within your scope of practice, but showing that initiative to do your research, prepare yourself as a professional um, for the things that you need to do, knowing when it's appropriate to check in and get that senior um, perspective. Always being helpful, looking for the little extra things that you can do to help the team out, not always waiting to be directed what to do. Actively seeking the learning opportunities. Are there particular areas you would like to explore? Keep note of any sort of really key exchanges, teamwork, patient care you provide because this is then evidence that you might draw on in your application. So make sure you keep those journals and notes. And everyone you're working with in the team really could be a potential colleague. Always be open to reflecting what the experience has meant to you and your ongoing development. What strengths have you demonstrated? What areas would you love to develop further? And of course, it's very likely you will be looking to your clinical supervisors to be referees for you. So at the appropriate point when you've really developed that relationship, you may well ask them if they would be happy to be a referee for you, have a conversation about how you might uh, run that referee relationship. Um, you must get their permission before you put their details down as a referee for you. And also do make sure you check they will be available whenever you're going into that recruitment process, uh, applying interviews or whatever format the um, selection process will take, that they are available to act as your referee. Some employers may give you some precise instructions about who they will accept as referees. So, you know, make sure you have a good pool of people. It might be if you're going for a paediatric position, you might have um, supervisors that could more speak to that component. Or maybe it's about having a pool of uh, referees who can speak to those sort of health competencies that you'll be demonstrating. So you might mix and match a little bit. So make sure you do have a good pool from which you can draw. 
let's talk a little bit about developing those career management skills in terms of connecting and making valuable connections to your sector. So, going through this whole process where we're learning about ourselves, we're exploring the options, we're identifying our key points of, of interest, and now we're starting to look at, well, how do I really develop myself uh, for those particular areas? So, for example, if you've got that interest in rural or remote health, in aged care settings, maybe emergency settings, are there groups, associations, clubs, LinkedIn groups that you could join up? And again, this can then go into your resume and starts to build your profile for those particular settings. You might start to sign up to newsletters that is going to give you um, constant information and up-to-date sector trends in those areas. If you can, you might start to look at volunteering that will speak to those different areas of interest. So you might need to be ready to tailor your resume to those different areas. So you might have a version of the resume that's tailored to adult work, paediatric work, remote settings, metropolitan settings. So it's about that sort of flexibility in how you present your professional identity. Here's a few examples. So you have your course page on Career Hub. So that will give you some starting links to uh, associations of interest, LinkedIn groups of interest. Also start to have a look at campus clubs and societies, getting involved with those like the Flinders University Rural Health Society and there's, you know, a few other examples there. Show actively um, that you're engaging and pursuing those interests. Following those organisations of interest to you. So you see a few examples there, Southern Health, um, Health Times, my health career have um, the latest news. The conversation is another free source of uh, a lot of information about particular sectors. So, for example, if you were interested in aged care, you might sign up to get those regular updates um, on that particular area. And again, that is all information you can reflect in your resume. If we look, look here, we've got a special page on Career Hub for the rural and remote and just some of the associations and groups that you might be interested in in those areas. So the Rural Health Society, Allied Health Professions Australia, um, their services for Australian rural and remote allied health. So and there's a few other organisations and newsletters you could sign up to. And that's just one example for one sector. Other ideas, um, you might be interested in doing some volunteering to sort of further develop knowledge, skills, exposure and contribution and interest to particular areas. Now, obviously, lately with COVID, um, that's been somewhat more challenging. However, many organisations are now offering online volunteering. So that's certainly something to have a look into. If there's any opportunity to take up roles such as being a student representative or taking an elected role in um, a society or club on campus, that's going to demonstrate a whole range of different skill sets that desire to, to take on that responsibility, organisational skills, leadership skills. There are mentoring opportunities and again some of those are currently online. Performing at your best academically, so that's another component, but also building that really diverse range of experiences, but knowing the value of each of those experiences. There is no just or only about any of the things that you do. It is finding the connection points to your sector. So that's from your casual work, placements, volunteering, um, sector-related casual work, for example, allied health assistant roles, sports trainer, depending, of course, on your particular discipline area. Document what you do as you do it as well, because that is going to help you with that next phase, marketing yourself. So here, it is absolutely never too early to start to develop the skills to market yourself. So having a current resume and a resume that is reflecting your professional identity. Now, some of you may well have a resume that's more about the casual jobs you might do, but create one where you can constantly explore 
and reflect your professional identity in your profession. And our module on resumes is going to take you through every aspect of that. Create a LinkedIn profile, really important, regularly update it. So that is a way that anyone you meet on placement, um, teaching staff, guest teachers, lecturers, uh, professional development opportunities, everyone you're meeting, connecting with past alumni, you can start to do that through LinkedIn. Some organisations can even search for candidates through LinkedIn profiles. It's also a great way to keep everything up to date. As you do something, you add it to your LinkedIn profile. As you do a professional development course, as you do a placement, and you can include your placements on there too. You can join professional groups of interest on LinkedIn. So also just consider when will I need to have my job search skills where I want them to be? So when do applications happen in my particular sector? What am I going to need to learn? So they are particular skill sets. They are particular styles of writing or presenting yourself when it comes to interview. So set up a little bit of a plan about, right, I've got to make sure I've got my current resume. It's all up to date. It's ready for applying for the graduate positions in my particular area or the position suitable for a graduate. I know how to write my cover letters. Um, and I've started to work on my interview skills. So have a plan. We've talked a bit about LinkedIn already. I'll just highlight a few things here. So we've got resources and we've got the link there for you on Career Hub to help you put that all together. You'll see here um, there's actually a Flinders University alumni page. There's over 45,000 Flinders alumni. You can search by keywords. So you could maybe start to make some connections with alumni in your particular course area from Flinders University, as well as all of the other people that you meet. Develop the interview skills. So we give you free access to the big interview platform. So we've got the link there for you. Um, and also just noting that every particular course page we've got in the health professions has got questions related to your particular sector. In that case, we're mentioning the nursing, but we've got sample questions for the speech pathology, physio, OT, so on and so forth. So you can develop your general interview skills through Big Interview, but then you can also go to your course specific page on Career Hub, download your career pack and start to look at course specific questions. And it's never too early to start to develop those skills. So you've got a whole online course where you can practice as well, record yourself. Let's just bring it all together now. So where a big focus today has been on career management, your evolving identity as a health professional. There's that circle just to remind us every part of your story um, may have a connection for your future job applications. The skill you need to learn is to understand how all those different experiences might be effectively packaged in your applications, your brand statement, networking with people, going to interview, how you can create that packaging to really articulate who you are and what you have to offer. We've got some more examples in the slide notes, but let's just have a look at a couple of examples here in terms of bringing together every component. So, okay, I'm just going to pause that there um, because I know that the three speakers that we've got for the um, next part are here to um, have a chat with you about their different career paths and um, to kind of highlight that what they've been through in their career and how they've got to where they are now. Um, there's a couple of minutes left on that, but I will. I am. I am putting the um, link to the video on Flow for you, so you can have a look at those final few e um, examples a little bit later if you wish. But I think some important things to start thinking about from that presentation, and particularly, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about those different skills and the skill set that you that you need to consider developing beyond just your qualification in the coming years. So what I might do is stop that there um, and invite the three speakers to come in. And come on down. <laughs> okay. 
So while they walk down, I'll just overall interview them. I'm um, not interview, I introduce them. So Hannah Rawlack is going to start um, with the session today, followed by I think Alex is going to go next and Denise. I'm going to let them sort of introduce themselves and tell you where they've come from and what they do. But I'm really glad that we've got three very varied um, speakers um, who have found themselves in all different kind of um, spheres of practice. So, that's an interesting little thing. <laughs> so, uh, that one. Look at that. Uh, yeah. Uh, do, you the, do you want this one or do you want the uh, hand one? Okay. Oh, that's down, not up. Uh, no, we're not going to update. So we will do that. Lovely. All right, so thanks, Hannah. And so okay. please, at the end, um, we'll have some time for questions um, so that you can ask them for a bit more information. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so I'm Hannah, and I'm um, going to give a bit of a talk of a slightly different pathway in nutrition and dietetics. Uh, and yeah, sort of tell you what I've been up to since I graduated at the end of 2013. Um, so firstly, when I finished my, I did the Bachelor of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, and then I uh, actually didn't go and start working straight away, but I went to art school and studied visual arts afterwards. And that was something that I'd really wanted to do for um, quite a few years, and I thought if I went straight into the workforce, I might never take the time off again to study full time to do something that I really loved as well. So I thought I'll go straight out, I'll do one year at art school, and then I'll start working as a dietitian. So that's um, what I did, and I think that was really helpful for me to get out of that really complex science headspace and go into a bit more of a creative space, um, and that's helped to sort of shape the career that I have, which I'll talk about as I go. Um, so then when I finished art school, I uh, went to start looking for nutrition work, and I was never interested in clinical dietetics at all. It just wasn't my forte. I was much more passionate about community and public health. Um, at the time that I graduated, the job environment was quite tough. Um, there wasn't a lot of community work out there. So I got myself an ABN and I started looking for my own opportunities and places that I could either be self-employed or do contract work for different groups. Um, and one of the jobs that I stumbled upon was working as a tour guide in the Adelaide Central Market, which is something I did for about four or five years and I still occasionally do a tour for them. And this was a really cool opportunity to develop um, I guess, group communication skills and public speaking skills. And I was able to develop nutrition tour content for them, um, which we then were able to implement with lots of school groups coming through. Um, I do cooking classes in the market kitchen, which is upstairs at the LA Central Market, as well as uh, some really fun nutrition challenges, like an amazing race around the market and all sorts of fun things, um, all about improving people's relationship with food and um, engaging with food in a fun way and some more traditional nutrition education content as well. Um, I also, for about a year, um, developed and run a, um, a program called Family Food and Fun, which was a preschool nutrition, like families and nutrition um, program run at Marion Uniting Church. So it was actually funding from the church that employed me as a nutritionist, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, and this was, there was a team of us, um, but I was the, the lead dietitian, and we developed some educational content for the preschoolers, age two to five. And then while they were doing that, I was doing a workshop with the parents. It was about an eight-week program, I think. Then we'd all do some cooking and we'd all eat together. So, um, yeah, some more traditional community um, nutrition work. Um, meanwhile, I also managed to score some um, paid writing work for a nutrition museum in Switzerland, of all places. Uh, and that came about through um, an opportunity when I was travelling overseas... Uh, in 2016 to the International Congress of Dietetics Conference. That was in Spain. Um, there was also a critical dietetics conference there at the same time. And I thought, well, I'm in Europe. I'm going to explore around, try and find some other cool nutrition things to check out. Found this nutrition museum called the Alimentarium. And I emailed them in advance and said, hey, I'm a dietitian from Australia. I'm coming over. Your, muse like, your museum looks really cool. Um, look forward to seeing it. Uh, and they actually re responded to me. And the curator um, emailed me back and said, hey, I like, would love to show you around, I'll give you a, tour, a personal tour of the museum. Um, and he had done his research on me before I came. And at the time, I had a nutrition blog online, which was part of some other contract work I was doing. And he'd read my blog, really liked my writing. So when I was over there, um, 
we had lunch and he offered me some paid work. So for the next few years, I did a few paid articles a year for their online magazine, which was really cool. So they're still up online at the moment. Uh, another thing that I um, was doing over the next few years as well was working as a research assistant here at Flinders on a food system literacy project. So we developed some or an online module uh, about food systems and sustainability um, and tested that with a group of people to see how it impacted attitudes and behaviours around food um, purchasing behaviour. Uh, it went, it was quite successful and the Food Embassy um, is an NGO that now have ownership over that program and they run it in different places around Adelaide. Uh, then in 2017, I um, was really lucky to get a job here at Flinders University in a role called Community Nutrition Engagement Officer, um, which uh, Denise is currently in that role and she'll probably tell you a bit about that as well. Um, but for two and a half years, I um, worked with our Community Nutrition um, Placement students. So in the fourth year of the bachelor degree and the second year of the master's degree, um, Community Nutrition Public Health Placements is something that you do. And I was working with councils and schools to manage some partnerships um, where the students would get placed and I'd be the dietitian who would support them through the placement uh, and do the assessments at the end. And these are just some pictures from some presentations that my students did. Uh, and that was really fun and I really enjoyed doing that for about two and a half years. And then I resigned to go travelling for six months <laughs> um, before COVID. Good timing. So meanwhile, all of that was going on. I was also um, building my own small business called Post Dining. And this is the way that I've been able to incorporate my creative side and my passion for the arts with nutrition and health. So my business partner, Steph, and I, um, Steph's not a dietitian. She has a drama, theatre, filmmaking background. Um, we have, we started, um, I guess we used to do lots of creative dinner parties together with our friends. Slowly they'd get more and more extravagant and more artsy. Um, we started uh, with a show in the Adelaide Fringe in 2016, a little um, degustation with playful food experiences, um, making things look like something, taste like something else. Um, performance artists coming in, not serving people cutlery when they were expecting to get cutlery, all sorts of fun things. Um, and that went really successfully and we've sort of grown and changed over the years. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the, so Post Dining is a company. We've just changed to a company structure last year, which is really exciting. And our mission is to disrupt and reimagine the relationship between people, food, environment and culture. And I think for me, this is like what I'm really passionate about as a dietitian um, is being able to kind of inspire people to think about food in a different way. And like the reason like, our profession exists is because people don't have a good relationship with food and all of the other environmental factors around that. But it's finding ways that we can get people to engage with food with a different mindset and in a playful way that is inviting them to think about things differently rather than sort of just telling them what they should be doing. But if you can like, spark inspiration, that's a good way to get people engaged to actually listen to your messages um, in a fun way. And so what we do is we design new styles of education and entertainment that challenge and engage the mind and the senses. And we do this by using food as a tool to connect people to ideas. Because obviously food is very powerful. Everyone, um, well, most people like eating food um, and can relate to food and it evokes a lot of strong emotions and memories. Um, and people love things that taste good. So it's a really powerful way to reach people. So we are a team of... Um, eating designers, consultants, experienced designers, artists, performers, filmmakers, dietitians, chefs. Um, Steph and I are the kind of overseers, but we work with, we engage with lots of different people in order to help get our messages across and do it in a, a way that's authentic and sustainable and where everyone does the thing that they're good at to come together to create a really cool project. So the way that we actually do our work, um, there's sort of three arms to the business. One is independent immersive theatre, uh, which I'm in the middle of a fringe season right now and I'll tell you about our show at the end of my talk, which is definitely sitting in the entertainment and the arts industry rather than the health industry, um, but there's very really strong, um, I guess, food sustainability and health messages underlying the work that we do. Uh, the second area is um, corporate and community eating design. So this is more consulting work where, say, um, a big company, uh, we worked with Ernst & Young, for example, two years ago, come to us and say, hey, we've got this um, event that we're putting on for our clients or our, 
uh, sponsors and we want to do something really interesting with food, can you design an interactive way that we can eat and we can engage people with food in a different way? So then they pay us and we design something really cool and we work with a kitchen um, who then delivers that. Uh, and the last one, um, educational workshops and talks. So we've done a few things with um, schools and we're working on developing some more this year and I've got a couple of placement students this year for the first time with Post Dining who are going to help me pilot some um, yeah, yeah, food and sustainability workshops in schools. Um, so some of the tools that I use in Post Dining um, to engage people with food uh, is we try to break the barriers between us as servers or performers um, and the guests. Um, and that's something that we do, I guess, so before COVID, we used to wash people's hands um, and dry people's hands, but there'd be a lot of um, touch and interaction in that. And it's a way to sort of break those barriers and get people to feel a bit more comfortable and relaxed, but also um, realise, oh, we're in a different kind of space and we're going to be thinking about some different ideas. Uh, something else that we like to use a lot is native and sustainable food. So, yeah, we're really big on promoting Australian native flavours and thinking about the land that we live on and what food naturally grows here and how nutritious that is and how we could be incorporating that um, into um, our own lives. And then some of the other interesting foods that we like to use to sort of stir and trigger emotions are things like edible flowers, um, edible insects, which we use a lot and um, gets quite interesting reactions, and edible weeds. So things that are all um, actually very nutritious, um, quite sustainable, uh, that people don't necessarily think of as being food sources, but actually are. So we're trying to expand people's idea of what actually is food. We really like to include First Nations perspectives um, as they, the traditional way of thinking about the land and about food just makes so much sense and um, just we really need to be thinking about that a lot more in our modern society as well. If you come and see our show um, at the Fringe over the weekend, you'll hear a bit more about this. Playfulness and connection is something that I think is really important and no matter what area of practice you go into, it's about creating rapport and like, I guess a sense of I don't know, interest and inspiration with people because if they don't really want to be there or then they're not engaged with the messages, they're just not going to listen to you. So um, that's something that we work, we do it a lot with the arts and that's maybe tricky in other contexts, but something I think is really important. And then future food is a really big theme um, as, or the future of food that we incorporate into a lot of our shows. And this is really fun to think about where food systems are going, where nutrition's going, where food technology is going, and challenging people uh, with sort of concepts around that. These are some concept foods that we um, that are included in our new show that we sort of talk about a little bit, and we try and do a lot of research around, uh, I guess, yeah, food technology and things, and include things that's based on science as well. So that. I guess it brings me to uh, the current show or the current piece of work that we're doing. Um, it's a show called Eating Tomorrow and it's an immersive theatre production that is on in the Adelaide Fringe right now. Uh, we spent a good year working on this and in terms of funding, um, we get a lot of our funding from the arts industry as opposed to health industry um, and that, I guess that's just like letting you know there's another option for different ways that you can look for funding and create work outside of traditional health roles. So we get funding from Australia Council of the Arts, Arts SA, Adelaide Fringe, and we can still promote some really interesting food and health messages, um, but through a completely different source or a, a completely different method. So this show um, is really fun and really exciting. We've had um, some five-star reviews and some four-star reviews on opening weekend last weekend. It's basically a walk-through journey of four different prospective future scenarios, how um, how the environment's going to look in those scenarios and how that impacts food systems, how it impacts what we could be eating. And so the themes for those four rooms are growth, restraint, catastrophe and transformation. Um, and so there we, get, we feed you in the show as well. There's some tasty snacks along the way, um, all themed around where we could be going in the future. So it's really, it's immersive. So it's, you're walking through, you're engaging with the actors a little bit um, or as much as or as little as you want. And... Uh, it's very thought-provoking uh, and has like quite strong sustainability themes in it. Um, I would encourage you all to 
come and check it out this weekend uh, if you have some free time on the weekend. Uh, we've only got four more nights of shows left. Um, we've got quite a few sessions each day, so tonight, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, we've just released a discount code for our final weekend, so feel free if you want to write this down. Um, it's a really, really fun show, and it's, I think, quite important for anyone who's thinking about food and the future of food, where we're going, what people are going to be eating, how people are thinking about food, which um, is all of you. Hopefully, that's why you're here. So, yeah, this is what I love doing, is challenging people to think a bit differently about food, doing it in a different way, um, and still being a dietitian and sort of promoting those messages um, like that. So is that me? I'm... After this, I'm heading straight into the venue to get ready for tonight's show, so I'm in a bit of a hurry today, but hopefully that was interesting and gives you a different perspective, and hopefully some of you might like to come along and see the show. Thanks so much, Hannah. I think, you know, one of the reasons that I asked Hannah to come along is because her story and where she is currently is so different to probably what any of you in the room would have thought of in terms of where your qualifications and your study could could lead, and I know Hannah's done lots of different things, has incorporated some more traditional roles in her career, but also some very different, different um, roles in her career thus far, which I think is just going to keep on going and going and going now. Um, so thank you for coming in, and yes, the, the shameful plug at the end, um, come along not to see, shameful. no, not shameful, <laughs> the, um, you know, to go and check out what Hannah's doing and just to get some more ideas of what you, know, what you could be doing down the track. Thanks so much, Hannah. And thank you for coming in. Okay. Oh, you USB. Good luck tonight, Hannah. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand that over to Alex. And let me just find your... My slides have gone a bit AWOL. Uh, there you are. Okay, so now uh, it should be turned on. Is it on? Yep. Okay, Thank so I'm going to hand over to Alex Day, who's working here at Salem currently. So thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, that was incredible to hear what Hannah's been doing. I wish that was something that I knew about when I graduated. I certainly am going to talk to you about a much more traditional <laughs> approach to dietetics, which was, I guess, when I graduated, I'd, there wasn't all of these sorts of roles out there. But before I start, I just want to get an idea of which area of dietetics everyone thinks they want to work in. So if you just put your hand up if you're thinking clinical is the pathway. Yep, food service. Private practice. And community. Very similar to when I graduated. So I guess I always thought I wanted to be a clinical dietitian and that was much like the rest of my cohort at that time. And when I graduated, I realised that that was going to be a little bit more challenging than I initially thought. So it was competing against all of your, um, your friends, realistically, for three new graduate roles. And then if there was anything available um, from other hospitals interstate or in the country... So when I graduated, I didn't gain any of the new graduate roles and I realised that I probably needed to broaden my idea of where I was going to work. Um, and so I started looking... This is a sort of the job and person specification. So when you graduate and you start applying for jobs, this is often what you'll see in an application. So it's um, the key criteria that you need to meet to apply for a job or that you need to write to into your application. So when you look at these, the key things that they ask for is planning skills, working amongst a team, being able to use email, internet, basic, um, you know, Word, Excel, um, good verbal and written communication skills and working with a variety of culturally and like linguistically diverse backgrounds. So looking at this, I thought, well, I don't need to become a clinical dietitian straight away, but what other areas of health or dietetics could I work in to gain some of these skills to apply for the job that I wanted? And that led me to my career pathway of nine different jobs in five years. So I graduated at the end of 2014, and I managed to gain a community position working for the Obesity Prevention and Lifestyle Program, which I'm 
sure you've probably all heard of. Sadly, the funding did end. Um, so I was fortunate enough to work for this program for the final 18 months of the funding and I had to move to Manham to do this. Um, so I was based in Manham but covered the whole Mid-Murray region. Um, so that was quite... Sometimes I was travelling up to three hours from Manham. Um, and my role here was, you might remember Opal, but they had different themes each year. So they were all focused on nutrition or lifestyle, sort of physical activity. So I was going into schools and communities to run, um, you know, one of them was about a healthy lunchbox. So I was running sort of five to eight week programs in kindergartens and schools all around nutrition and healthy lifestyles. I was also involved in the council and gaining funding to run community gardens to get um, funding to put in place gym equipment in the communities, um, looking at policy development around breastfeeding or healthy nutrition in the council. So it was a really broad um, area. My, I wasn't employed as a dietitian, then the title was a project support officer, but it still had very much a nutrition focus. I guess some of the challenges here was I never thought I was going to have to move away from home. So, Manham, luckily, was only an hour from my home, but it was still a big move, especially having a first job moving from my family and partner. But I learnt a lot through this. I had to become a lot more independent. It was also long-distance driving. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you now, country driving is a lot different to metro. So they offered to put me through a country driving <laughs> course because they didn't trust me on the roads. <laughs> so that was an added bonus. My next job was... Actually, when I finished Opal, I decided I hadn't got to do much travelling with uni. So I was taking a month off and I thought, oh, when I get back from travelling, I'll look into work. And at the time, you all know about um, there's a mentor program you do when you graduate. And my mentor said to me, you're more employable if you're employed. And I'd been offered a position working as a research assistant at UniSA. And research was certainly not an area of interest to me. <laughs> um, but I thought, I'll take the opportunity. There's skills I'm going to gain, thinking back to when you're looking at those job and person specifications, I was going to be working much more independently, but also in a team. I was going to be gaining um, skills in using statistics, literature searching. So I thought, well, these are all skills that will be useful for me when applying for that clinical job that I wanted. Um, so I did this and I managed to last two months in the position and I found it very challenging it was very much a sedentary job, which I knew was something that wasn't for me. I liked being on my feet. I liked talking to patients, whereas this was very much computer-based, searching for articles all day long. But I learned a lot of skills through it. But what I realised was, for me, I wanted to work in that healthcare setting, even if it wasn't as a dietitian. So that led me to my next role as an allied health assistant. And these jobs are... They're, they're quite... Um, there's lots of hospitals, we all have allied health assistants working for us and you don't need to be a dietitian to work as one. So this is something to consider sort of when you're in your third, fourth graduating year that you can start looking at these sorts of jobs to gain um, experience. So I was an allied health assistant at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and it was split between an occupational therapist and the dietitian. So every morning I would spend... Um, doing shower retraining. So the occupational therapist developed a program for their patients who needed to regain skills in showering. So definitely not working as a dietitian, um, but it got me back working amongst a multidisciplinary team, working with patients, and then I'd spend my afternoons being the dietitian's assistant. So that was where I was going and looking at food charts, making sure patients were tolerating their supplements. And I guess one of the challenges of this was in my mind, I knew I was a qualified dietitian, yet I was very restricted in what I was allowed to do in this role. It was very prescriptive in what I was allowed to write in the case notes. But it was such an incredible experience in doing that networking, getting familiar again in a hospital, writing case notes, um, speaking with patients. Um, but shower retraining also was not my cup of tea. <laughs> um, I can tell you now there was a lot of uh, feces, um, with patients in showers and I thought, okay, I've got to get out of here. 
I dry reached, I think, uh, four out of the five days a week. <laughs> so that led me to private practice. So when I was applying for jobs, I was getting feedback as to why I wasn't getting an interview. And they said, well, you're not working as a dietitian. And I thought, that's because I can't get a job. So I thought, OK, how can I put on my resume, I'm a dietitian? So that's where I went to private practice. I worked for a company and I covered different sites. So I was going to Murray Bridge, I was going to Aldinga, Mount Barker, all over Adelaide. And I was mainly dealing with veterans, so our DVA patients. So a lot of chronic conditions, I was seeing them for one-on-one -on -one consults. Um, and I just did this part-time while I was also working as the allied health assistant just to get that experience again in, in, I guess, doing those diet disease links, implementing plans with patients. Um, so what I found challenging about private practice was my manager wasn't a dietitian, so I didn't have that support. I didn't have the professional development opportunities through my company um, to really build on my skills. And this is where I relied heavily on my DAA mentor. So definitely utilise your mentor. That's what they're there for. Um, so I got a lot of support. I had to seek external professional development. But it was a challenge. As I guess I felt like a, a new grad still and I hadn't worked as a dietitian. Um, the other thing is really look at your contracts if you go into private practice. I wasn't on a salary. So if patients didn't come, which happened a lot, then there was no income. So I was potentially driving sort of two hours both ways um, and all patients with DNA. So just something to keep in mind, but certainly learnt a lot as well. You had to be very resourceful, very independent, um, didn't have that multi-D team, which is something I, I wanted. So then I got a job in aged care. <laughs> and again, this was a Melbourne-based company. I drove around to different aged care sites across Adelaide and they were all one-on-one -on -one consults. So a lot of the patients, it was mainly malnutrition um, or they might have had cancer, but I guess a lot of deconditioned clients. Um, and their goal wasn't always around nutrition, um, but it was about looking at their quality of life and improving that through the, the food that they were eating. Um, so I was also able to do lots of staff education as, as well around the importance of nutrition and hydration for patients at this point in their life. Um, again, I was working as a sole dietitian, so my manager was in Melbourne. I still had lots of support, but it was all via phone, which was very different. So again, I didn't feel like I was a part of a team. And not everyone, I mean, some people like that, but I knew for me I needed to, to really work amongst a multi-D team. So then I got my job with Country Health Connect in Port Pirie. So again, I moved to the country, and this was the most amazing experience. So in the country, you get a huge variety. So I was working both in the hospital as well as their outpatient clinics. So the hospital was sort of anything from patients who might have had a stroke who were on modified diets to needing enteral feeds. I covered the dialysis unit. Um, they had lots of cancer rehab. I then would spend the afternoons doing outpatient clinics, which again was a lot of chronic conditions, irritable bowel syndrome, but I also got to work in paediatrics as well. So a really big variety. Um, in the country as well, you often service other areas. So I was sort of travelling from Port Pirie to Crystal Brook to Jamestown, which is all sort of like 30 to an hour um, away from Port Pirie. And again, covering hospitals, outpatient clinics. <coughs> we did lots of community-run programs around nutrition, working with Aboriginal community. Um, I ran lots of non-diet approach courses out there. So a really, really big variety. Um, again, challenges was I was up in, I had finally got back to Adelaide and I was again moving to the country. So picking up my life um, from my family and my friends, long distance driving. I was often coming back to Adelaide most weekends, which was about a three hour drive. But this is something I would encourage you all to give a go. You don't get this variety often in the metro sites. You're very much sort of set in particular areas. Um, so I highly recommend do it early in your career as well because it's something that when you sort of settle back down, you may not move away again. And then my final job. So now I've been working in rehab. So while I was at Port Pirie, I was fortunate enough 
to get a short-term contract working at Hampstead Rehab. So for me, I knew at some point I needed to return to Adelaide as I had a partner here. And he was pretty much sick of me doing the long distance commuting all the time. So I was looking for opportunities and I got offered um, Hampstead Rehab Centre. It was short-term contracts, which often is, is the case early on in dietetics is there's not, um, you know, it might be six months, 12 months. And I was concerned about giving up Port Pirie for a six month contract. So they agreed to me doing it part time. So I did two days a week at Hampstead and then I would travel after work on a Tuesday night to Port Pirie and work as well. So it gave me that opportunity to get my foot in the door, see a different area of dietetics that I hadn't done before. Um, and then this led to my interest in rehab. So from when I started, I knew I wanted to work in clinical, but I actually thought I wanted to be a paediatric dietitian, which is why I did my final year placement at the Women's and Children's. And then when I couldn't get work in paediatrics, that's when I sort of broadened my area and trialled all these different sort of community, private practice, aged care, and then finally got to trial rehab. And that's been a big area of mine um, in my passion in that rehab's about seeing patients who might have had an injury or illness and they've lost skills. So whether they've had a stroke and they no longer can swallow like they used to and they might be on a modified diet or they might need enteral feeds. And so you're working with patients over a much longer period of time. So some patients are with us for a month or two um, and they're patients who aren't necessarily as, they're not as acutely unwell, so they're more motivated to um, really invest in their health. They want to regain their skills to get back to the community. Um, so in rehab, I have been working, I worked at Hampstead, Modbury, and now I'm working at Flinders Rehab. Um, so I see a lot of patients post-stroke, I see patients from brain injuries, um, post-amputation, um, cancer rehab, so very deconditioned patients, um, so they're probably and and renal, so they're sort of the main areas that I see. Um, so something I yeah would recommend: be open-minded, don't pinch and hold yourself too early. So I know everyone's got sort of in their mind where they want to work, but take opportunities. Don't feel disappointed if you don't get that first job that you wanted as a clinical dietitian or in community or food service. Give, as we've seen, dietetics goes beyond what I've talked about. Um, so just keep an open mind, give other things an opportunity and network. Something I did a lot of was workplace shadowing. So I went and spoke to senior dietitians and went and saw them in the hospital or in their private practice just to keep um, my foot in the door and get, gain that exposure. Thank you. Are you happy to hang around for a little bit? Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Um, just in the essence of time, I'll get um, Denise to come up and um, go through her career path as well, and then maybe we'll have a couple of minutes at the end if you've got any questions in particular. But I think probably what you are seeing is that there are quite varied different um, speakers so far um, with, very, with all different messages. Denise, that's there we go. you, and I will let you introduce yourself. All right. Hi, I'm Denise. Um, I, I did this last year as well and I had a look at my slides and one of the, the key things for me is that I came from a different career. So I popped it up there because I do a little tricky, um, I put my Bachelor of Science with honours so that no one really knows that it's not in dietetics. Um, but it's really important that I can show you that no, there is absolutely no learning that you ever do that is not relevant. Everything that you learn in this degree, and you, if you decide that you're going to take a different path, you will use that learning wherever you go. So for me, I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I did my first year here, actually, but it was the very first year that they did marine biology. So I thought, well, I don't want to be a guinea pig, so I'm going to go to James Cook University, where they are the masters of marine biology in Australia. So that's what I did. I ended up falling in love with freshwater ecology and that's what I did my honours in and that's what I worked as. Um, so I did that, loved it, very environmental. I was out there to save the world. Um, 
if you want to hear more about that, you can ask me later. But basically, I, I threw that all in and went travelling. So I went and lived overseas for about three and a half years, I guess. Came back, tried it again, realised it wasn't for me. So what I did is I actually employed a career counsellor. There's actually these, these people out there who are really skilled in helping you to direct your career. So I'd really highly recommend it. It's very expensive, but it's worth it. Um, and what we came up with was um, dietetics, nutrition and dietetics. And the reason is that you do one degree and you have like three or four areas that you are qualified to work in. Um, so while I did my, I think I did my personal training certificate before I moved back to Adelaide to do my masters. So I graduated in 2014, which means my last year was in 2013. And um, because I'd worked as a, I worked as a personal trainer here at the university and elsewhere, that really gave me that one-on-one -on -one kind of setting. I got to, I got to uh, do a bit of practice while I was learning. Um, and so that really set me up to do private practice. The other thing I did, I was very strategic in in choosing my DA or my DA mentor, I um, I found someone who would potentially give me a job, and that ended up happening. So um, during my mentorship in that first year, I I came across a private practice role, and and that's that's what I did. Um, what I found with this role is that I learnt a lot. I learnt heaps. I learnt, I learnt how to do patient notes in 20 minutes because, and this is the downside of this, I had back-to-back -back patients for 20 minutes. It was a bulk billing clinic, so there is no gap. So you, what you work at is, is, what, you, is what you see. And you're working um, with people who are usually on a care plan. So they need to see three people, three professionals, and a dietitian. Usually the GP's like, oh, yeah, I'll chuck you in one for the dietitian. So no one is going to benefit from one 20-minute session with a dietitian. So then there's those sales aspects of that role too. Um, I was like Alex on a, um, you know, on a commission-type basis of payment. If someone didn't rock up, then you weren't paid. That happened a lot and it happens a lot. As a part of this role, I felt that isolation as well, but I got myself into a group of other dietitians and we met once a month, which just helped. It helped to be able to go, oh my God, I'm feeling this, I've got this patient um, or client. And, and that really helps, having that network. So that's where it's really important to network amongst yourselves. I know that last year with COVID, it was really tricky to do any kind of face-to-face, -face, but I really encourage you to get to know each other because it's my colleagues and and that I did my degree with, and those either side of us, that I really get a lot of support from too. Um, so because I had that personal training, that fitness background, um, I applied for roles that had that aspect. And every time in the interview, is there an opportunity for me to be able to use my dietetic skills? Oh, absolutely. Because they're very happy to pay you as a as a fitness professional who usually gets paid less than a dietitian and use your dietetic skills. You can't take your dietetic skills away from, from what you know. You're always going to have them. So I kind of leveraged that to be able to um, gain this role as a lifestyle advisor for the Royal Flying Doctors Service. Um, I can't remember what I've got next. Okay. So in this role, I was there for about three, three and a half years until I fell pregnant with my first child. And then that is where your lifestyle setting situation means I can't fly. I can't fly with a small child. Um, so that kind of ended that. But what we would do, you'd see in these small RFDS plans, you see them flying over all the time because they're red on the bottom. Um, we would fly, so I travelled remote. So my areas were Hawker in the Flinders Ranges. We drove there or we would drive to Port Augusta and then fly one of the small planes up to Hawker. And along the way, we stopped and had little clinics out of the planes. Amazing, fascinating, huge eye-opening experience. Um, 
You get to know after about, it took about six months to start to get to know the community. The other areas that I went to was Cooper Pedy and Udnadatta. So I'd fly into Cooper Pedy and then drive to Udnadatta. So lots of remote rural driving. I'm from the country, so that is not an issue for me. A bit of full driving on the Udnadatta track is, is an adventure. Um, and also I got to work closely with the, you know, that multi-D team as far as the medical side of, of what the flying doctors do. And it's just, it's amazing. I'd love to have a dietitian with them f full time in every clinic. But of course, funding any kind of not-for-profit is challenging. So that contract came to an end. So I had my baby, maternity leave, decided, at, I think my child was about six or seven months, I decided I didn't quite enjoy the four walls aspect of being a stay-at-home mum. So I was looking for roles and found um, a role that with Arthritis SA, um, and I'm very much drawn to that not-for-profit kind of condition-based um, setting. So with the health educator role, it fitted in nicely to my family, and so this is where my, my the way that I looked on my career changed, because I've got these, you know, as soon as I had my child, I was like, oh my God, these are, this is amazing, having a family, and so your priorities change. And so this was a role where the interview was um, do a presentation, because a part of this role was presenting arthritis to the community. Um, and so what an interview to have. I was going to ace the interview because I'm very good at public speaking. I have real, really strong skills in presentations and and helping connect, like connecting with groups. So I got the role and then of course in the interview, oh, what, is there an aspect, you know, is there a way that I could use my dietetic skills? Absolutely. So during that role, um, I had an opportunity to put a business plan together to put a private practice in place. Um, and that was, that was going to go ahead right until I went on maternity leave to have my second baby. So that kind of put a bit of a spanner in the works. But I came back to this role and I grew it as, as was needed for me. You know, I worked hard, I did really well. And so then putting my case forward to have a bit more FTE. So I worked initially when I got the role, it was only two days a week and I built that up to three, you know. And then I could have built it up more, but then, um, and then I needed a change because they went through, through some really big restructures. So then I found this role that I'm working in now. And Hannah, she was my predecessor. So um, she set up some great projects for me to follow along with. And now I've, I've been in the role for over a year now and I've had the opportunity to be able to see how things work, how I can change it and how I can move to create my own kind of um, mark on this role. So what I do is in this role is create some placements, but we don't call them placements, they're nutrition projects. So we create these nutrition projects with organisations that don't have a dietitian on board. So I become that dietitian, I become the AAPD to support the students doing the work of these projects. So all of that networking and all of that really rich relationship um, development has happened and when you're in one of these roles it's your job to really maintain that and you get to see how relationships um, really drive any kind of community and public health kind of role. Um, something I'd mentioned to my students that I've got recently is that <laughs> I'm a, I'm a community dietitian at heart. <laughs> I do love clinical and I love private practice. I'd love to work in food service too. Um, but what I found in my experience is that community diet and, and public health dietetics is so much more complex and rich and it is a lot harder, I believe, to be able to get successful programs than any other area. Um, but that's, you know, that might change because as you go through, your life changes too. And it doesn't mean that um, anything that you've done or you're thinking is a, you know, of changing is a failure at all. All learning, like I said at the start, all learning helps develop you to be able to move towards where you want to be. All right, thank you. Thanks so much for your time. I can see that you're all spacing out. It's been a morning of just at you and you're probably hungry. 
Thanks so much, Denise, and to Alex and to Hannah, who's dashed off. Um, I know that we're running a little bit behind time, but if, did anyone have any burning questions for Alex or um, Denise? Uh, oh, Owen? My take on that is that you can get a, you can become a nutritionist after doing an eight-week course. And during my time at Flinders, furs was a huge part of my whole university experience. I started out as the discipline rep for speech pathology, um, and then in my third year, I had the opportunity to be the co-president for Allied Health. Um, and if I had to pick my best experience from my time with furs. It would probably be a combination of all the rural high school visits. So uh, I had the chance to go out to Renmark a couple of times and also to Mount Gambia. Um, and these visits are where you go out uh, with a bunch of other FERS members to a rural town, either for a day or overnight. And uh, I guess present to rural, uh, rural high school students, encouraging them to come to uni and study a health degree and sharing what you love about your degree. But at the same time, you just get to meet a whole bunch of other uni students from different health degrees uh, and get to know what they're studying, but also just have a bit of fun. I think either way, if you sort of uh, know that you wanna work somewhere rural after you graduate, or if you just wanna meet some other people while you're studying at uni, Either way, I think joining FERS is, um, would be a great idea. Hello there. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm currently just an everyday member of FERS, but in the past, in 2019, I was the co-president of medicine, I'm currently a final year medical student and also the president of the Flinders Medical Student Society. Uh, I decided to join FERS in my first year of uni because I was interested in rural health. Uh, I grew up in a semi-rural location and was pretty keen to sort of get involved in that throughout medical school and it seemed like a really friendly bunch of people. Uh, my favourite experience with FERS is pretty hard to actually think of what the best one was. There's quite a few. I think probably the RFDS experience where you get to go up with the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, and see what they do for the day and sit in the plane and see what happens uh, at the base. I thought that was pretty amazing. But I also really enjoyed some of the other events like Wilderness Health Night uh, and even just getting to meet a bunch of like-minded sort of students was a really great experience, especially the fact that it was multidisciplinary. So it was all of health sort of got me just out of being just in the medical sphere and getting to meet a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of really, really interesting degrees. Um, in terms of where I see myself going in the future, I'm pretty keen in a career in rural medicine. I got to spend my third year uh, in the Brosser Valley, which is sort of like semi-rural and had a really great time there and pretty keen to go back to working in that kind of environment. Um, and I suppose I really got a lot out of FERS in my, well, I'm not done with my time there, but over the past four years, I definitely learned a lot more about uh, rural health. I le learned a lot about sort of like the inequalities in rural health and what we can do as students to really work on that. Um, I got to go to the NRHSN National Council and meet up with a whole lot of other sort of enthusiastic and like-minded students. Uh, and they taught me a lot and it was a really interesting experience. Um, and I also, like I said, I got to meet uh, so many different people around the uni from so many different degrees that I wouldn't have ever had a chance to interact with otherwise uh, and they've been a really great bunch of my friends so yeah it's been a really great experience and I definitely recommend you join up. So if you'd like to become a member of FERS register at the NRHSN website and if you want to keep up to date with all our events and what we've got going on follow us on Facebook. Yeah, so there you have it. There's a bit of a snapshot of who we are and what we do. Um, we have uh, an event we've got planned, just a kind of meet and greet coming up at the TAV in a couple of weeks. So have a look at our Facebook page and that will give you more information. Most of our events are advertised there. Um, but I do 
honestly encourage you to get involved because it is a really fun group of people. Um, and as I said, it's one of the only clubs that's multidisciplinary. So you get to meet a whole heap of really interesting people who are interested in health but not the same sort of health as you, which I think is really important. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, so, Jane, I might hand over to you if you're happy with that. Oh. Hi, everyone. It's probably uh, the next morning, uh, but for the new Master for Community Graduates, um, I'll be teaching some of you. Uh, which is role and function, but I'll also, I'm also the student experience coordinator. So I would encourage you, if you are coming into any difficulties with your studies or issues that are impacting your studies that are outside of um, university, then um, I'm a contact person for you and I can um, refer you to other services that there are on campus. Uh, and the other thing I do is uh, men the uh, peer mentoring program. I oversee that. So some of the services that we have on uh, campus are o Oasis. Uh, they are based up uh, at the top campus. Uh, they've got uh, a building there and they put on um, social activities uh, across the university and they have volunteering uh, opportunities um, and one of those is in the community market which I'll talk to you about in a moment. They also have uh, spaces where you can meet together as students. They put on uh, yoga. Uh, meditation programs. They can provide um, some services for you, for example, um, welfare assistance. They've got quiet spaces where you can go and relax or th and they have prayer rooms as well. So one of the other things that you can be involved with on campus or off campus outside of your studies is volunteering. And one of those is a volunteering opportunity to be a course management committee rep. So what does that mean? Um, there are representatives from each year, so first years uh, right through to uh, final year of the master's program. And what those reps do is they survey their uh, fellow peers to find to provide some feedback to the quality uh, committee that happens twice a year. So if that, that's, that's uh, some of the ways that we pick up on some of the issues that students might be having um, and uh, that, that can be re regarding your study in general around the course as a whole or regarding specific topics. So there's specific topics that you've um, struggled with that, um, that there can be improvements with, uh, things that you've enjoyed about that uh, specific topic. That's um, some of that feedback. So, um, so if you're in for first years, we're looking for uh, reps for the course management committee, something to, for you to think about. Uh, and if you are interested, then uh, contact Jolene for that. Other opportunities to volunteer are a program which I oversee, which is called STU, which is um, the Students Eat Well. Uh, that is where, stu where I do some training and I train you as nutrition and dietetic students to provide nutrition activities uh, for other students on campus. So it's sort of like a peer uh, teaching. So you use your nutrition expertise that you'll develop as you do this um, degree to impart that knowledge and those skills to other, uni uh, other university students. Uh, so it's really designed um, to assist you in uh, learning more about uh, nutrition but also uh, practicing some of your skills in uh, communication and pres uh, presenting nutrition information. So the aims are to increase your knowledge and skills for healthier food choices, but also those um, engagement with the university um, and provide some of those competencies in health and nutrition promotion. I've just been in a meeting today with um, Carolyn, one of the other dietitians here. We've uh, talking to um, a group of people about a healthy campus initiative and we'd love to get some students involved in that. Uh, part of the planning and how we can actually make Flinders a healthy campus. So there, there, there'll be some opportunities there. So some of the activities that Stu, uh, I'm hoping is going to happen this year, many of those activities didn't happen last year because of COVID. 
but um, there'll be things like um, a, a National Nutrition Week stall. So we, we have a stall together and uh, you as students will be helping to run that stall and be prom providing nutrition promotion activities and information to students on campus during Nutrition Week. There are a range of supermarket tours. What I'm hoping to do is train some of you in doing supermarket tours to, um, for some of our international students on campus or to anyone that might be interested in learning about healthy food choices um, in, in the supermarkets. There's also university open days where students come uh, from schools uh, or prospective students come um, and hear about the different uh, degrees that are happening and we provide um, activities for that and students involved with that. And there's information day. So specific schools say, can we come and have an information day? Uh, and uh, again, we get uh, students involved with doing specific nutrition activities with the um, high school students. And there's also the community market, which um, I mentioned. The Community market is uh, where they have a sale for, it's on every week and they sell um, food and clothing and the food is donated from uh, the food bank. And so it's really one way for uh, the university to help with um, food insecurity on campus. There are a lot of students that don't, uh, that run out of money uh, and we found it was particularly a problem last year with COVID and people were struggling to pay the rent and actually having food at certain times. So um, this is a, an opportunity that uh, you can be involved with in actually giving out the food. One of the things I found out yesterday is that normally um, the students do cooking demonstration um, but I've just found out that um, they're not going to go ahead unfortunately for this year. But there's, there will be op other opportunities for you to do uh, cooking demonstrations. So the training that I organise for Stu is about um, food handling and food hygiene, um, presentation skills, uh, thinking about behaviour change and um, that whole model if we want students to change their uh, behaviour and thinking about um, a healthy campus initiative, what are some of those um, strategies and what are those theories around behaviour change. Looking at med recipe modification and also one of the tricky things is actually doing a cooking demonstration where you're preparing food and talking at the same time so that it is a skill. Uh, I'm sure many of you are good, great cooks and some of you can do great presentations but doing them both at the same time can be quite tricky. So. Um, there's um, training in that as well. So I will be, uh, when you finish today, I'll be calling for volunteers to see, you can come and see me if you'd like to sign up for Stu and do be part of that uh, training uh, or you can email me or look on the, uh, the flow site for connections if you want to um, enrol for Stu. The other thing I talked about this morning was uh, the peer mentor program and some of you first years met with your, um, your second or third year mentors. Um, I've also introduced a mentoring program for our third year BNDs and first year master's students. This is partly from uh, the quality management committee, so from that, uh, those student representatives that fed back to us, they said that they would like to have some of those final year students who are out on clinical placements or on uh, community placements or food service placements provide some mentoring for the students in the year below. So if you are a BND3 or an MND1, there is that opportunity for you to have um, a peer mentor. I've got about 15 mentors already signed up. So they're much smaller groups than for the first years. And one of the, the so I've just started getting some of the feedback and they found it was really valuable for helping them study for some of the clinical exam topics and also for um, their oral vivas, practicing those oral vivas. So think about whether you want to be involved in uh, being a mentee. If you are a third year or a second year and you'd like to be a mentor for the first years, there's still uh, time to do that as well. 
Um, so that's just a summary. So study tips, practising oral vitamin and, and actually giving you some information and uh, what to expect when you go on your placements in final year. And the, the last thing I want to do, just mention is for you to be involved in the university more widely is to join the, um, to join the rural health, which we've heard from Kirsty. If you are from the country or if you're interested in working in the country, fantastic opportunity, so please join. And the other group that um, is really good to join is the Flinders Uni Nutrition Club, which is called FUNC. And uh, Chris, are you here? Would you like to come? And tell us a little bit about that. We've got three of you, great. Yep, yep. There are a number of um, Facebook pages as well for a lot of these um, activities. So the uh, Student Union, Student Association, uh, the Oasis Group, um, Funk has got a, a Facebook page. We've got a Stu Facebook page as well. So that's a way that you can keep up to date with um, activities that are happening. All right, I'll pass you over. Hi everyone, so I'm Chris. I'm the outgoing secretary from last year, 2020. I'm Adele, I was the president last year. And I'm Liz, and I'm the outgoing treasurer. So who are we? We are FUNK. So FUNK is a non-exclusive social club for students across all the nutrition degrees, so BHN, Exercise Science, BND, MND, Health Sciences majoring in Nutrition. If you've got friends who are interested in nutrition but are not necessarily studying in nutrition degrees, they're also welcome to join us. It's a chance to meet like-minded individuals who are super keen on food, nutrition, cooking, stuff like that. So these are some of the events you would normally have in a non-COVID year. Unfortunately, last year we could only have our welcome breakfast before all the restrictions kicked in. But this year we are looking forward to having these again with our new committee. So please follow us on Facebook. We've got a public page, which is the bigger image. And we've got a smaller private group where we will share details about events, so the when and the where. Please join that as well. It's Funk 2021 on Facebook. And it's really important to join that because we've got an event coming up, the Welcome Breakfast, and we'd love for you all to be there. So please join the FUNK 2021 group and vote on the poll on your availability. We are also going to call out for president or co-presidents. So if you've got a friend and the two of you want to be co-presidents or three of you, go for it. It's a really fulfilling role. Adele can tell you more about being president. Um, it's a great time to be involved in uni, especially after a whole year of online study. And it's definitely a great chance for you to gain skills like communication, um, confidence in being a public speaker, being a good leader, stuff like that. So definitely a good chance. Adele? Um, I guess last year we couldn't really do any events. Um, but yeah, it's great to do all that extra stuff like we haven't heard, like hearing about all morning, just to add to your resume to make sure, you know, you the job one day. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah. And there's already a treasurer and a secretary, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're not very sure what to do, don't worry, we are all here to help you out if it's like your first big role and stuff. Yeah, thank you. others so hopefully that's given you a few ideas of you know things that you can join things to think about um, you know sort of beyond university study and beyond your part-time jobs and things that will contribute to that overall kind of well-rounded university experience um, so the next session that we've got in the last session for today is looking at um, study tips from um, some students who have been there um, I'm just gonna put that on there now, um, the students that we've got coming in to talk is a current final year BND and final year MND, one, a final year MND student. So they're going to be talking more specifically about sort of third year BND and first year master's study um, and tips of sort of how to make it through that year because it tends to be um, one of the more challenging years um, in the program. So first and second years, you're welcome to stay for that and sort of hear about what's to come and you'll probably pick up some tips along the way as well that will be useful for you guys but 
if you do have other things to get to, I also understand if you need to sort of slip out um, and move on to whatever else you've got planned for the rest of the day. Um, I just wanted to say if you are getting up and going, thank you for coming today and hopefully you've got some useful information um, and sort of not feeling too overwhelmed for the start of the, start of the year um, and that myself and the other staff members are really excited to have you on board and to sort of watch how you develop and grow over the next um, two or four years, whatever, however long you've got remaining um, over the remainder of your course. So we look forward to working with you in that time. But in the meantime, I'm going to invite Morgan to come up because I think you're going to speak and kind of facilitate. And I think I saw the students at the back. Can I see that far? There you are. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> All right. So, hello again. Yeah, star of the show. <laughs> um, so, I was first asked to give study tips when I started my PhD, which was, I think, four years ago now? Three, four years? Something like that. Um, and what I thought I would do was do my little presentation of the things I wish I knew then, but I know now, because I can give... The, those little tidbits to you and hopefully <coughs> what I'm about to tell you will act as signposts so that as you go through this year, you know when to stop and pay attention. So for third year students, you are being prepped for your final year. You're being prepped for your placement year. So every subject that you do will get you ready for your public health nutrition placement, your food service placement and... Um, Nutrition care process will get you ready for your clinical placements. So I'm just going to look at each of those subject areas independently and um, give you an idea of what to look out for. So in public health nutrition, you'll come up against something that is called the evaluation bicycle. Um, now, I, as I said earlier um, today, it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting exactly where you are and there is so much information that you're going to get that it's going to be a little challenging to understand what is really important and what to pay attention to. So now three or four years on, I'm still using this every day. I'm doing a project with Helping Hands, an aged care home, and this is the model that we've gone back to. So this, as you get taught this, this is something that's really important for you to pay attention to. In food service, you will be doing a menu planning uh, assignment and it's a major piece that you'll be asked to do and you'll be that's a group assignment. It's really um, common for students to divide that up and so that one student will do one part, another student will do the menu planning part, and another student will do another part. And what that means is that not everybody gets the chance to look at developing a menu. Now, if you do decide to go into food service, um, then one of the things that you'll be doing is evaluating and helping to develop uh, menus in hospitals, in childcare and aged care. So this is a really valuable opportunity. So when you get into your group for this one, try and make sure that everybody has a go at looking at that menu. There's four weeks that you need to develop, so have a go at doing a week each if you can. In nutrition care process, you're going to be doing something that's called a SOAP. And this forms part of your clinical care and documentation as you go through. So um, you will be practicing this in um, the nutrition care process and your clinical topics. You will have case studies that you'll be doing. Now I know that when I did it, and you'll do them in a group of about 15, is that right, Jolene? Yep. Yeah. You'll be divided into groups and you'll get a case study, so you'll get somebody who's malnourished or somebody who's diabetic. When I went through, the common approach was let's get in, get out and, you know, get on to the next thing. You will get far more out of these topics if you invest time into them. So in these clinical topics, practice your diet disease links, practice writing the soaps. Don't go in with the idea of let's get out as quickly as we can. Invest the time there. You've got tutors that will come into your, into your group and help you write and evaluate your SOAP skills. This will all be in part, um, this will be in your exams. Um, so this is something that you'll need to be comfortable doing. So practice, take the opportunity to practice in your case studies. 
you will have to you have two oral exams called the oral vivas and the first one is your formative which will happen in semester one and the second is your summative and it is a gateway you must pass that in order to progress so once again you will be uh, you will have the opportunity in your case study groups to practice things like your diet disease link, which, are, which will form part of your oral viva. And again here, so a diet, a diet disease link is how can you, in very simple language so that your grandma could understand, how would you describe how carbohydrates impact a diabetic? How would you describe how sodium impacts blood pressure? So that's what we would call a diet disease link. And again, practice those with your peers in the groups. Form study groups to practice. Practice your oral viva um, as often and as frequently as you can. There will be um, practice scenarios put up on Flow that you can use um, and definitely form groups and practice. Go to the supermarket go to the supermarket for an hour or two every week. And this is especially important if you are an international student or you're still living at home with your parents and not responsible for doing the grocery shopping. You will have food product knowledge questions in your oral viva. Um, and it's important that you know what foods are available to the public and you know what, what they're going to be buying and how to help them make a healthier choice. As part of your oral viva, you will need to do patient education. And that will be part of your placements as well, is patient education. Um, there is an online site called NEMO, which is the Nutrition Education Materials Online, and it's done by Queensland Government. And they've got an excellent range of patient education materials that are really easy to understand and will help you impart your knowledge onto um, the everyday person. Uh, we talked about this earlier today, Dietitians Australia membership. Um, it's free for students and there are a ton of benefits there for you. So I strongly encourage you to um, sign up for that. And again, as part of your student membership, you get free access to PEN and there are more patient education uh, resources there as well as if you can think of a nutrition question, the answer is on pen. Is coconut oil beneficial for Alzheimer's? The answer's on pen. Like anything that you could think of that you don't know the answer to, it's all there on pen. It's one of the most valuable resources you'll have. And just to wrap up before I hand on um, to the other students giving study tips, how many people here are currently using EndNote? Yep, again, I'd like to see everybody put their hands up. When you do uh, your assignments, EndNote is a lifesaver. When you go to do your, either your honours or your independent studies, you will absolutely want EndNote and it's worth spending the time now to learn how to use it. It's free. The link is there in the notes on where to download it. Um, it doesn't... Uh, the Students uh, Support Centre, the Student Learning Centre can give you support on learning how to use it and it's absolutely worth investing time now to learn that because it will make your journey so much easier along the way. So those are the things that I wish that I knew when I started. Does anybody have any questions before I pass the baton? No? All right, so who do we have up next? So just talk amongst yourselves for a moment while we find just the technology. Um, Zoe and Alison are also um, they are doing the school for um, elementary three and elementary one. So we won't need to do any better for you two minutes. And elementary one, oh, oh yes, that's fine. So there'll be an opportunity for you to meet uh, Alison and uh, Zoe after um, just as well. And while we're waiting, how many lateral transfer students are here right now? Okay. I was a lateral transfer student. I started with uh, Bachelor of Health Science Nutrition and transferred across. 
And so I'm very aware that you are going to face some unique challenges to the students that enrolled in um, BND1. If you do want support, if you do want uh, someone to talk to, hit me up because I, that, that was the path that I took. So, yeah, if you want extra support, I'm here for that as well. So can Masters catch up with Zoe and uh, BND with Alison? today and sort of give you a bit of an overview and some tips and things that they've learnt and maybe they wish they'd known this time last year. Um, so we've got Zoe Sibia who's an NMD2 student and Alison Hetner who's a fourth year BND student. So thanks ladies. Um, yeah, so hi, uh, my name's Alison and I'm in fourth year Bachelor of Dietetics at the moment. Uh, this is Zoe. Um, we're just, yeah, going to tell you about our year. Um, our year was, I think, particularly difficult because we were right in the middle of, obviously, coronavirus. So, like, our whole first semester was meant to be tutorials and stuff like that, but it was all online. And then our observation placement got cancelled and stuff like that. So, it was a bit difficult, but there's obviously some things that we've learned that might be able to benefit you, maybe not. Um, yeah, so just on the board briefly, it's kind of like where we've been. So I had um, ward allocation at the Lyle, um, and Alison, you had it... Oh, at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Okay, right through, yeah. Cool, and then at the bottom, that's just where we're headed to on placement this year as well. Um, so for semester one, your semester one, just a heads up, it will be a lot lighter than semester two. So if any of you have part-time work or are looking at doing some volunteering, semester one is the, the time to do it because that's when you will have a lot, of, a lot more of your free time. Um, so if you kind of map out your commitments now and prepare for that um, because semester two is very workload heavy um, and especially with the, the major oral viva at the end there as well. Um, yeah, so when you get into fourth year, they'll start talking to you about um, like fattening up your resume and stuff like that. And you're really busy in fourth year, so if I had my time again, I would be more uh, proactive, I reckon, in the first semester of third year. So I would like just get out there and like volunteer for Meals on Wheels, like run 10K to raise money for cystic fibrosis or something like that. Like anything that's gonna like sort of set you apart a little bit, because you do have a bit of free time. I mean, obviously do your uni work and stuff, but also, uh, yeah, part-time work, fourth year's not that cheap. <laughs> Um, so here's just a quick brief calendar. So this is from my semester two. Um, and just a heads up that the schedule was kind of changing month to month. Um, but you could see I could still kind of manage to work on the weekends um, and still fit in some soccer and that sort of thing as well, kind of, which is important for your downtime. Um, but yeah, you can see that uni did fill up a good chunk of the week. Um, but then if you see from the next month, it kind of changes as well. But just for me as a visual person, I felt that it really helped map out my time and help with my time management to just chuck everything on a calendar. So whatever thing you guys think works best for you, um, I found that was really helpful to keep on track so you're not missing lectures or tutorials and that sort of thing. Um, so this is kind of like an outline. So semester one um, consisted of the nutrition care process, communication, nutrition, counselling. Um, and then if you're a master's student, you kind of, depending on your study schedule, you have two electives or one elective um, and then you'll do nu nutrients, role and function. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and then, yeah, the BNDs was 
Oh, yeah, those four. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, this is really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's most important to make sure that you do do the readings um, and come prepared to the tutorials, otherwise you will be left behind. Um, it's the best time to ask any questions or clarify anything that you have. Um, and as well with the topics of communication where you do have some assignments, there's some group assignments and I think this is really important so you can get to know your peers really well um, because hands down I think the number one tip for you this year is to make sure you make networks and connections with the peers that are in your year as well as the ones that are in masters with the bachelors and vice versa um, because you got you really rely on your peers to get you through this year um, yeah number one advice so form little study groups um, make some zoom calls just yeah make sure you connect with the people that are in your year because it's yeah yeah, it's always good to have someone you can message at like 1.30 in the morning and be like, hey, like, what are you thinking for this sort of thing? Not collusion, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the first semester was, as I said, like less assessment based, but like don't mistake this for I'm just going to cruise along because when you get to second semester and then obviously fourth year, they've already taught it to you, so they think that you know it. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, take the opportunity yeah, to ask as many questions as you can. There's stuff that comes up like reflection writing and like all of the research stuff that you do in epidemiology and you might think, oh, I don't really fancy this. I'm not gonna really try that hard, but it's gonna come up again <laughs> and you're gonna think, man, I wish that I had done more of this when we were get getting taught it sort of thing. Um, so yeah, stuff for Mahara in communication and counseling, that's really, going to be integral and the stuff you do in nutrition care process just is going to come up for your whole career. So yeah, pay attention during the first semester. Um, oh yeah, and yeah, enjoy the tutorials with your friends because you don't really get to see anyone in fourth year. So make the most of it sort of thing now while you can. Um, so this is just a brief um, rundown of like the nutrition care process and what we thought were kind of the key points. Um, so the ready retina is something that you'll become familiar with very soon. Um, I advise you to become familiar with that as soon as possible because this is pretty much your bible throughout the entire year. You'll use this in second semester as well in clinical. Um, but yeah, so the ready retina is that's kind of like a screenshot. But you'll come become familiar with that um, within the first first few weeks. Um, but yeah, make sure. Download a copy, print a copy out, adapt it, change it, make it your own so then it's easy to flick through. Um, yeah. This is just a brief rundown of the electives for masters. So if any of you are looking at any, any of the electives, um, you can come see me after as well if you want to chat about them. So I've just put that up there too. Um, so this is just about ward allocation. Um, you guys in the first few weeks will be doing the CSSU, um, which is pretty much where you guys will be recorded, um, doing an interview. Um, and it's really simple. It'll just be like an opening of a uh, patient um, dietitian interaction. But make sure you watch it back because this will set you up for your placement or your ward allocation. Um, and key advice when you do get there, I get that it's a bit further down the track, but um, when you do get to your ward allocation, make sure you're specific when you first see your patients um, and outline to them what this interview is going to involve because a lot of people haven't seen dietitians before or they don't know what it's like. So make sure you just say that you're going to be there, you're going to ask lots and lots of questions um, about the types and how much food and drink they're going to be having. Um, so just make sure you're clear from the get-go. Otherwise, some patients you'll get to breakfast and they'll be like, oh, wow, you've asked me so many questions already and we've only just just done breakfast. So, yeah, make sure you're really clear with that. Um. Um, if you're anything like me, uh, getting the, the opportunity to watch back a 10-minute video of you talking into the computer is like a nightmare. But do it because that's the only way you're going to learn. Um, so, yeah, with the CSSUs and then with the oral viva as well, you get a recording of yourself. Watch them, <laughs> learn from them. Um, oh, yeah, with the oral viva in the first semester, it's... Um, it's formative, so you can, you know, put in as much effort as you want. I'd urge you to put in as much effort as you can because then when you get to the summative one, you're going to want as much, like, personal feedback as you can get because you're going to be really nervous <laughs> and it's really hard. <laughs> um, just for your water allocation as well, I'd recommend you guys get a polo shirt that'll say Flinders University and it'll have dietetics on it because then the patient's 
know why you're there, who you are. And then also the nurses and the nursing staff as well can easily identify you. So I definitely recommend that you guys order that um, and order it sooner rather than later as well. Um, Um, so semester two is clinical, so this is further down the track for you guys. Um, but this is a very um, content heavy topic and that's why it is worth two topics as well. Um, and it, it, ca it definitely takes a lot of your focus for the entire semester. Um, and this is, but this is key, it's really important. Um, and nutrition care process, you do in semester one, all the information you learn in that flows into semester two for clinical. And um, that's where you'll do your oral viva as well, will come, will come kind of hand in hand with that topic. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so just in summary, get to know the people that you're working with, um, ask for help, they're really nice. They'll reply to your emails and they'll help you out if you need it and stuff. Manage your time and your workload. Um, don't get into bad habits like I did, like going to bed at four o'clock in the morning and then trying to get up and go to your tutor at nine. Like it doesn't work, obviously, but some of you would try it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, reflective practice and research, they're gonna come up time and time again, so pay attention. Um, and yeah, if you've got any free time, fatten up your resume, I think. Yeah, just make sure you get to know your peers, hands down, um, and form little study groups, because that'll, that'll get you through the year, for sure. Good luck. Thank you. The other thing that I would like to add is don't discount any of the different fields of dietetics. Like you may not think you want to get into food service and I didn't either until I did food service and I loved it and that's where I am. So don't think, don't rule anything out. Be open to all the possibilities and go into each subject with enthusiasm and try and get as much out of it as you can because you won't know until you've been on your placement what that's actually going to be like. So be open to everything. Any questions? Yeah, I definitely, definitely valued having the mentor, especially for ward allocation and stuff. There was a few, um, I don't know, she was just there at the right time and it was really helpful, some of the tips. So definitely reach out if you need any help to your mentors because they've obviously been through what you're going through now. So they're the best person that can relate and help you guys out. Um, yeah, and even for oral vivas and exam prep, they just had useful tips as well. So yeah, make sure you reach out. My mentor was a very busy gal, so we didn't get a chance to meet up, but I've made friends with people in the year above me and then just asking them just for advice on the oral viva and stuff. Like, people have already done it, they obviously know, and everyone's so nice, they're willing to help you. So, yeah, as I said, get to know your peers sort of thing. It'll help you out. The Griffin's Handbook? Yeah, well, it's the Griffin's. Yeah, that's yep. the nutrition yep. that I didn't have any when I was in that. Yep. Yeah. And so if you find that you've used like the library and things for textbooks, and I guess like there's just some reading that you could put on. Put yeah, there was some plenty of readings. Yeah. You might need to find your own readings. Yeah. <laughs> Do them though, they're important. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess. One of the comments that I would make is that often, um, and like last year was very different um, compared to a, a normal year, and hopefully this year will be more normal than last year, is that whenever you're learning something, whether it's content or skills, there is a reason why you're, uh, you are doing that or learning that. Um, and sometimes it's not always apparent until you get to the point now where Zoe and Alison are, um, that you realise, well, okay, there was a reason for that and why, you know, that it was important should have practiced that more, that kind of thing. So just keep in mind that we don't have things in the program just for the fun of it, okay? <laughs> it's all there for a purpose. It's all part of that progressive learning. And I think what you, what you mentioned, Gail, was in terms of, you know, using each other, relying on each other to kind of help, you, help each other through things. You know, because it is a busy 
I'm so far away from it when I was here last mm. year that I was like, oh yeah, I'll just like deal with that as it comes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't <laughs> think about it lots. That's fine. Okay, any other questions? What, what would you say was the biggest like one of the biggest challenges for your prep? For mm. placement. So in water placement? Water placement, mm. what was kind of like one of the biggest challenges that you had to think about? my ward placement that wasn't something that I was really super nervous about um because it's you get obsessed but you're with clinical advisors at the start and they kind of talk you through it a little bit and you're with uh like your peers sometimes as well I didn't think it was we had done a lot of in nutrition care nutrition team placement counseling lots of stuff like where to sit in a room when you when you meet the patient and like the right ways to talk to them and stuff so uh, that wasn't too big of a worry for me yeah, definitely. Um, I think because I've come from like a customer service background, talking to people was pretty easy. And mm -hmm. so I didn't have an issue with that. It was more so when you get patients and they've come in and they're kind of, they've been in a nursing care or someone provides all their meals. That was a lot harder to do a diet history because they themselves didn't really know what the types of foods they were eating. Um, so that was a bit like, that was a bit difficult. Um, but obviously you've got to try and manage that in the real world anyway. Um, and so I guess you'd ask parents or family or partners in that instance whereas we didn't really have that opportunity because it was just a one-off sort of thing that we had. I would like to that as well don't just go to patients who look nice because uh, mm. all through I was like just picking and choosing I was like she looks like she's really nice <laughs> to talk to and then when I went to do my summative one they just gave me someone and I didn't really have any experience with people who didn't want to talk to you and people who just had no idea what they ate and stuff like that so get a bit of experience with the good and the bad And that really is the bare minimum. Um, if you can do 10 or 12, the more you do, the better it is. And so I think it's, you know, now's the time to stop, you know, you might not be thinking this way, but stop thinking about things as a tick box exercise. It's kind of like those six skill developments and the more you do, the better you will be um, when it goes on to placement. So those that have done 15 ward allocation interviews are going to be more advanced and more prepared for placement than those that did eight. Even if you pass the eight, we can always be better um, at 10 and 15 and so on. And don't underestimate the time that's in place for that, for that placement. Yep, definitely do more than your eight. Um, my, my little secret here is there will be things, some of you will fail at some things. Your first attempt at something, you may fail. I failed my ward allocation on my first Me attempt. Too. Right? And that was because I picked the ones that were nice to talk to <laughs> and I ended up with a grumpy. Um, or I ended up with, yeah, I just, I didn't develop the skills that I needed by challenging myself. I went easy. Yep. Um, so you will need to um, go into a ward. You'll be allocated a, a healthcare environment like Flinders Hospital. And you will need to go into the ward that you're allocated and take at least eight diet histories from random patients. And it is very tempting to go in and say, that person looks like they're easy to understand or they're well oriented or, you know, whatever, to try and cherry pick the people that you do it with. But when it comes to your final one, if you don't, if you haven't challenged your communication skills, then, you know, you run that risk of tripping over yourself. And that's exactly what I did. If you do fail something, it is not the end of the world. Come and talk to one of us. Um, we can, you know, talk you through that. It's not easy to fail. It's not easy to fall flat on your face and then have to pick yourself up again. But, you know, the best of us, that's how we learn, is through failure. So don't let that put you off. Um, keep going. So you'll do ward allocation to start from this semester, right? From semester one as part of the communication team.
be advised that we practice on what trending on the Islam station that we'll be asking um, Asian friends of just to get yep. that impression out. Everybody. Definitely. Do a diet history on everybody you possibly can. two hours away but I find I get more out of it when I come to lectures but that's just me personally um, and hands down coming to the cases and I remember we formed a study group and we came in before the cases to kind of go over them and then the next day we would have the case and then work through that as a group as well um, so I was always just trying to come in whenever I could um, but maybe that's off the backhand of being stuck at home because of yeah. COVID as well, you know. Yeah. So I think, I think semester two, everyone was so glad to be particularly yeah. in the semester and that everyone kept that. I guess um, what I will say is, I guess there are years gone by, it's probably been about three years where le it was compulsory, it became compulsory for us to record lectures. Prior to that, in my topics, I didn't record lectures because it's all part of my job. Um, and, you know, I have to say that in the, between when we brought in grades and topics we dropped. Um, as attendance dropped, um, grades dropped. So maybe keep that in the back of your mind as well. And there's some lectures where you will be doing hands-on calculations actually in the lecture. So when you start to use your Ready Reckoner, there'll be exercises that you'll do that are much easier to do if you're here in person and can interact with your lecturer rather than doing it all um, remotely. And that, and that can be as simple as the audiovisual won't pick up, you know, what's going on around the room, whereas if you hear, you, you, you'll get that. So. consistently there was like a month towards the end there where oral writers and exams and stuff were on where I just pretty much didn't work at all because I was pretty stress head but um, throughout the year I, I worked pretty consistently. Yeah yeah I was the same um, worked out Woolworths so semester one that was full on that was a lot of hours <laughs> that was almost full time hours um, but that was all right because a lot of it was online but second semester um, my contract was 18 hours and that was a push sometimes yeah. Most people didn't work. I think no, yeah. most of my friends didn't work. Yeah. We might be the anomaly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess the thing is, the final year, so 
doing my brand now is that you're on block placements and so you're working full time for like 10 weeks full time for seven weeks on placements and so it becomes quite challenging to put in um, part time work in the final year. So I know some students tend to work more in the third year, the end of the third year masters to save up some money. Um, but um, yeah, as I say, it does get a bit Sometimes just to make you feel, you know, tell you it's going to be okay. Because um, I think yeah. that's the other thing as well, is like knowing that when you get to that point where you're feeling stressed and you're all big, that can somewhat put your mind at ease and say, yeah, it's terrible at the moment, but it's going to be okay for a bit. So if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank the three experienced students. <laughs> They said, I'm final year, they go, and we barely see you and you barely see each other. So it's always nice to, to chat that they they made it through the summer and they're still around. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's right. Me. Where do I put that? Oh, stick. There we go. <laughs> okay. So. Let me just turn all this off. Yes. Yes.